Then now we will begin the Data Journalism Korea Conference 2021. First, we will hear opening remarks and welcoming remarks. The opening remarks will be given by the co-chairperson of Data Journalism Korea Conference, Ms. Kwon Hae Jin, and also Professor Hwang Yong Seok, the Director of Digital Communication Research Center at Congo University. Then we will first hear from Dr. Kwon Hae Jin. Please give her a big round of applause as she makes her way up to the stage. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Kwon Hae Jin, Data Journalism of Korea CEO. I'd like to welcome to all the audience watching the Data Journalism Korea conference. And we are able to show what data journalism in Korea is about to the rest of the world through the real-time YouTube streaming. Data Journalism Korea Conference is a conference which makes the programs with the former and current journalists, such as the data journalists, developers, and designers in order to have the promotion of the ecology of data journalism and information sharing. The organizers of the conference prepared a variety of programs again this year. Yesterday, we had the pre-conference with hands-on workshop on news big data analysis using big kinds and also an online online roundtable for data journalists would be with much popularity. And we are going to have the main conference today, and I'm very happy to see that more than 200 people finished their pre-registration. That will be followed by the second Data Journalism Award Ceremony. I sincerely hope that we can learn, connect, and have new insights all together through the conference. Lastly, my deepest thanks to the many staff to organize this event despite so many challenges. I applaud you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kwon Hae-jin, for your remarks. Now we will invite Professor Hwang yong seok the co-chairperson of Data Journalism Korea Conference, to the stage. Please give him a big hand. Hello, my name is Hwang yong I'm a professor of the Media Communications Department at Congo University. I'm pleased that Data Journalism Conference has been able to be held continuously despite the challenging circumstances. And so many people have provided support to make this conference possible. So we are taking part in the Korea Press Foundation's Journalism Week for two years in a row, and the KPF has extended us with various supports. I would like to thank Mr. Chung bong gun the Executive Director of News Circulation Business at KPF. PF and Mr. Chong De Pyo, the co-chair of the committee. After the conference, the Data Journalism Award will be held, and I would like to also thank those who provided help, Ms. Irene and Mr. Kim Min-sung of Google News Initiative, and President Song Jae of Korea Broadcasting Journalists Association. Above all, this conference has become possible because we have a community of data journalists, and this conference is for you, so I hope you will engage in active exchanges and learn a lot from the conference. Lastly, I would like to also thank members of the organizing committee and DOT planner uh, for its role as a secretariat and students at the Graduate School of Congo University for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hwang yong -so. Now we will hear welcoming remarks from Mr. Chung bong the executive director of News Circulation Business at Korea Press Foundation. Please give him a big hand. Greetings. I am Chung bong -gun, the Executive Director of News Circulation Business at Korea Press Foundation. I extend my heartfelt welcome to you all for coming to Data Journalism Korea Conference 2021. As said by the two speakers before me, I express my regret that the conference had to be held online again this year. I welcome those who are joining us via YouTube today. And I would like to express my gratitude to Jada Journalism Korea and Digital Communication Research Center at Congo University for hosting this conference. I would like to also extend my appreciation to our keynote speakers, Mr. Lee gyu -yun, CEO of JTBC, and Ms. Park hae -yun, Deputy Editor of Graphics at the New York Times, and to all other speakers. 
This conference provides an opportunity to look back on the accomplishments made in data journalism and to give an outlook for the future. By sharing our wisdom experience in data-based innovation, we will be able to discover new value of data journalism, and this new discovery will enable us to take another step forward. It's been four years since the Korea Press Foundation joined Data Journalism Korea Conference. In particular, since last year, we've held a pre-conference to kick off the Journalism Week. Journalism Week facilitates communication between the media and the public, and it is a week for celebration. It's the only event of its kind in Korea. I'm truly honored that Data Journalism Conference is heralding its beginning. Thank you for the opportunity once again. With COVID-19, we're all facing new changes that we've never experienced before at a very rapid pace. The media is also doing its best to present a way forward for our community to move forward in this difficult time. Data journalism identifies disinformation, discloses the truth, and delivers meaningful information to us by showing objective information based on data. The foundation is also contributing to creating new value through sharing, cooperating, and opening news data through our news big data analysis system called Big Kinds. I hope this conference will serve as a meaningful time to find insights for data journalism to move forward in a new and innovative way. The foundation will also provide support in advancing data journalism further. Once again, I would like to thank everyone for attending this conference. And at the end of the conference, there will be the Data Journalism Awards. And I extend my congratulations in advance to those who will receive the award. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director Chong bong And now we will hear our keynote address. So after each presentation, there will be a 10-minute Q&A session. So allow me to introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Mr. Lee Gyun, the CEO of JTBC. So allow me to introduce to you who Mr. Lee Gyun is. He's been a journalist for the past 33 years, and he's been the first head of the Bureau of the Press at JTBC. And Lee Gyun's Spotlight is a program that he has run for the past six years. So he's been a person at broadcasting and journalism and news and so on. So he has many disciplines. So the title of his presentation is The Future of Data Journalism. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Good morning. Very nice to see you all. Actually, as a keynote speaker, I am here to talk about the data journalism. I am very much humbled to say that I am able to make any speech about that. I'm actually a student here. I'd like to learn from you as well, because the world is changing day by day. In the middle of that, I'd like to know and share with you what the shape of data journalism is, and I want to. I was also want to know if my concerns are resonating with yours as well. So I'd like to have those opportunities with you. That's why I accepted this invitation. Most of you, the audience, and also the experts of the data journalism watching this YouTube, you might feel that I am a very old guy. I started data journalism a long time ago. It's been about 10 years I alienated myself from the data journalism, actually. The only thing I can say to you is that I was actually one of the pioneers of the data journalism. I was the one who tried many efforts, and those efforts of mine as trials that have continued for about 10 years has become a footprint of the past. So that's my feeling now. That is why I chose the topic of my presentation today as the lineage and future of data journalism. I'm also a CEO of uh, the media. As the CEO and the top management, I also have a fresh look at the media and the data journalism from the perspective of the management, what and how we can accept from the data journalism to the media organization. So let me start my 
talk today. In the 1990s, that was the time when we used the word C-A-R, data journalism. The word was not there then. We had C-A-R or computer-aided reporting. So it means that we used computers when we report. After that, in the 2000s, data journalism started to take root as a jargon. And also, another word came out like algorithm, robot journalism. But I can tell you that the algorithm, robot journalism, can be a part of data journalism as well. So I can tell you that from the 2000s, we had the era of data journalism altogether. Let's talk about 2021, now, today. How do I use data journalism now and here? I'm actually a frequent user of data journalism in the form of the big kinds, which has been produced by KPF. I'm using the big kinds in many ways. I can tell you my examples. Immediately before I became the CEO, I had planned a special program with the commission by the top. That was a special investigation. So that was the title for the lives changed by COVID-19. We had the three series documentary. In the time of planning the documentary, or I can when I can write columns, actually I use the big kinds every time. I just put my idea into the big kinds in order to see not just articles, but also many other things. For example, what I do and the big kinds is that if I want to see a plan of the we go to the era of COVID-19 and the time of changes, then I go into the big kinds. I key in the words like new normal or post-COVID. So these are the keywords I use. So the thing I wanted to know is about the new normal, right? So I wanted to know the changed world by the COVID-19. And then I was able to see all different other results, what kind of articles are there, what structures they had in the newspapers. It was very easy for me to have the structural view of the keywords used in the media. So it's quite easy. So in the big kinds, this is big kind, and you key in the keyword of new normal. And then from the 1990s until today, today means the time of the day I, want, I was working on that, right? So I was looking at the patterns of the articles. If there is a result of 671 articles, then since the 1990s up until 2020, these the words of keywords have been identified in what form and in what frequency they have been appearing in the newspaper. This is also a result of the tool used by Big Kinds as well. You see the trend of these keywords. So I can have an insight, like, for example, in 2010, the word new normal started for the first time. And also suddenly from September of that year, the word new normal appeared out of nowhere. I wondered why. That was because the Wall Street Journal used the word new normal. And after that, many other media used that word so much. Therefore, there has a sp spike in there. And then they had the very substitute period. Only after COVID-19, we have another spike coming up. So COVID-19 was found to be not temporary. It f was found to be everlasting. So it could be a momentum to change the whole world. That was found in about July last year. That was the time when the word new normal was accepted to the general public of the world, and it became a serious word afterwards. Also, this is another example to see from the big kinds. The only thing you need is to log in, and you can see these things. So I'm still talking about the word new normal, right? So I use the word here in order to have the relationship here. So it has the relationship with other words like smartphone, life site system, president, global, smart life system, the fourth industrial revolution as well. So these are actually the connected words that are often used by the media when it comes to new normal. 
normal. So think of these words, smart, life, system, president, global. Then it gives you an idea that you have to go deeper into these new words as well. Then you also you might be knowing that you should use these words in your next articles. So that's what I felt as well. Let's go back to 1999. For me, that was the time when I started to have a very serious you know, works on the writing the article here. So as a planner of the articles, I was using this tool on a daily basis and I chose big kinds from KPF in order to continue our writing. Also, when I was asked or commissioned to write something on, that's also the time when I use big kinds. So if I go back to 1999, I would like to show you examples that have been found to be interesting when I started to use the system. So these are the articles that I actually delved into in order to use those in the system. So CAR was often used in 1990s, as I said before. So that is computer-assisted reporting, I said. So this is one example. It was in the 1999 when I had the Langun report, and that was the site report. I had all the collection of resources, such as interviews. I had Excel programs or any other statistical programs to have all these resources in, as you see here. It was the time when CAR was proper, because this reporting was based on the computer. And as I said before, up until 1990s, CAR was the it word, and I used the tool myself at that time. So this is another example of showing you the article that has been based on the CAR. I used the Excel, actually, right? By 2004, another word came up. That's GIS, Geographic Information System. That's the reporting based on the GIS. Actually, I've been to the conference in the United States by that time, and I brought a brochure in English. And I looked at the brochure and learned that there is a GIS or things like that. I wanted to use GIS for my reporting. But I was that serious at that time. I was just only trying once and for all. And then 2004, I was reading deeply in a book of GIS. And I learned that there are five steps of doing the GIS. I learned I learned myself, I taught myself about this as well. So I went to a computer company to try to the reporting based on the GIS. Of course, that was very lightweight program of GIS. This is nothing comparable to your system nowadays. But we had our five steps to go through, and one application was the reporting on the tropical night heat system analysis. In the city of Seoul, I was able to see that some areas like Yeongdeungpo and Kuro were not so much hot, while the other areas were so much hot and at night so they, they cannot sustain the heat. As a result of this GIS system, I was able to see the results of the, all the impacts from the buildings, rows, concrete on the street, and so on. I was able to combine those resources from the GIS system and the insight from the areas and the sites. The result is that the more concrete you have, the less green you have in your neighborhood. So the neighborhood without green might be hotter than other areas, not having so much concrete. So I think this is the very early version of GIS reporting that you're doing right now. Another example. So this is the practical analysis that I did. Actually, that reporting of about the tropical heat was the first trial. I didn't know much about the technology, and the system companies didn't know either. So I feel quite embarrassed looking back when I was doing that. So I could have done better. I could have done things more interesting. But trial itself was meaningful for me at that time. So you might be laughing at this when you see this.
but this is the analysis. It was about 2005 at that time. For the first time in the academy, there is a new jargon called social network or social network analysis. That new keyword began to emerge, so it's called SNA. So by that time, using SNA or social network analysis, I was wondering what reporting I could make using this. I happened to have a meeting with Professor Kim Yong Hak, who used to be the president of Yonsei University. So the professor had a textbook for college students about the social network. His book had volume one and volume two. That was very difficult to understand at that time. So, well, after receiving those two books, I was wondering what I could do. So I had my agony, what I can do. So probably I can use an SNA for my reporting. Also, I happened to know the HR database in Chungang Ilbo, Chungang Daily. That's who's who in Chungang Ilbo. And the Chungang Ilbo's who's who was bigger than any other counterpart in Korea. So I was trying to combine this SNA concept with the who's who. So I decided to have the analysis on the power elites in Korea. About 300,000 power elites, so to speak, in Korea could have been connected by region, by academic background and neighborhoods and so on. So I was wondering what kind of connection they might have. So this book is not sold anymore, but this book itself was very thick. So that's the result of my analysis. So we ha also had the newspaper articles about the analysis into the power elites of the people. And then also this article says that this power elite, which which had been very strong in the past is now crumbling down. So some of my bosses were supportive of this writing, but many of the reporters at the time were not so much. If you are looking back at this newspaper article right now, you can accept it without any reactions. But that was like 2005. Please remember that was a long time ago. Many people argued, why do we have to carry this article? You are so nonsensical. What are you doing this for? Of course, some of my seniors were a pre apprehending me, but you know, some others, or oh, many more others, were not approving me for doing this. So that was very negative reaction I had after writing this article. This is the deep analysis of my article. So this is the process I used. By 2008, finally, this was the time my, when my curiosity was heightened and I really wanted to use data journalism. So I didn't want to commit to others. I wanted to do it myself. So even if it's a small project, I can be the whole owner of the project. So I decided to taught myself. So I had a very simple tool called Usenet that was free trial for one or two months when it was distributed. So I asked around, I called professors to ask questions, and then I was able to use the Usenet myself. I key in the data for the results. So this is the result of my efforts. There was a junior reporter of uh, my mind, and he was very thorough in the legal affairs. And he had a, an article about the propensity and orientation of the judges. I was at the desk, and I was responsible for his coverage. I told him, I told my junior staff reporter, that you are writing this article, I know that, and if you just bring me the resources, I will do the uh, application of your resources into the UCNet, and I will give you back the result of that analysis w with one condition. The analysis and that work 
network analysis ha should, has been done by Yi Gu Yan myself. You have to write that down. You have to make a comment that this resource was given by Yi Gu Yan. So if you look at very closely right now, you see my name in here. So I was doing this for fun actually. So I did the homework at night at home. So that was the analysis of the propensities of the judges. Now, in 2010s, we have the period of the smartphones. S-A-R replaced the word S-N-A. S-A-R was not gaining so much popularity. It was kind of the derivative of the word C-A-R. With the advance of the computer and smartphone, systems, we used the word SAR at that time. That was about 2020 when we had a special report on the smart things and the IT. In Seoul National University, they had the smart algorithm data analysis team. So we had the experiment of writing up the articles about the baseball games. So it was kind of competition between me and the team. So I wrote my article about the baseball games, which I watched. So I wrote 1,200 letters in 35 minutes. That's not slow, right? But the algorithm by the team took only three minutes. But after I finished it, there were two errors, two typos. And the algorithm which finished the writing in three minutes did not have any typo at all, while I had two. So that gives me a lot of thought. So probably the reporters and journalists can just stay put at home for a while, or the reporters can stay put forever by the use of the algorithms. So I was both comfortable and fearful at the same time. So robot journalism was gaining popularity at that time. Now, let's talk about 2021 and plus regarding the data journalism. Nowadays, I am looking at this data journalism right now as the management rather than journalists. I'm collecting all of the resources regarding this. So one of the things I would like to show you is the prospect by Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism in Oxford University. It's about the analysis of the impact by the COVID-19, as expected by many other organizations. We can also see the increase of the social media and the increase of the advertisement and over-the-top systems. Also, the progress of the technology related to the fourth industrial revolution. These are all the areas impacted by the data journalism. Nine out of 10 said that digital innovation building would be the most important thing, according to our survey. About 69% or 70% almost said that the AI, data, and metaverse will make biggest impact onto the journalism within the next five years. Let me now talk about the example of The Guardian recently. In 2020, they issued an opinion article written by AI in September. As you see here, the first sentence of the article is that, I am not a human, I am a robot, a thinking robot. I use only 1.12% of my cognitive capacity. That's a reporting made by the AI. And also BBC created a documentary using AI. The documentary lasted about one hour. That is also based on the archive owned by BBC. The archive was also in the use of the AI programs to create a, a do, documentary. Facebook is another company that is very active in metaverse by 2030 AR and many other things will replace the internet of today. A lot of investment is made for the researches by Facebook. Before Facebook releases a product, they're also having the press conference in the workroom in the metaverse with the reporters virtually. That's 
skip this. Recently, this is K-pop related article based on the data journalism and resources we have. Time is left. I have to be punctual. I'd like to just close up and wrap up now. For example, algorithms, metaverse, or big data are likely to replace the current data journalism. What conversion can be made and what convergence can be made amongst them? That is my interest nowadays. I'm not saying that this kind of data journalism will have to be stay on one article or one kind of activity only. It should be linked to the change of the whole mechanism or trend of the data journalism. Only when it does so, there is a future for data journalism. I am punctual to keep the 30-minute time frame. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. While listening to your presentation, we have received a couple of questions on the chat box. So can we spend time first on answering those questions first? And then also, if we have more time, we will also have discussion with you about the data journalism you presented. As the audience heard, Mr. Lee Kyu Yan is a quite well-known figure for a leading presenter of a social affairs documentary. You have given us the presentation regarding the investigative report and data journalism starting from 1990s until today. And you were the pioneer of this sort of new journalism type. So many of us must have learned for the first time you are a pioneer of the data journalism. Thank you very much for detailed presentation. We have very comprehensive questions. Two of them are, you have given us the cases in your experience, out of your experience, what is the most memorable one in your experience in this investigative and data journalism? Yes, thank you. What does data mean? If I ask this question, I would have to answer this way. Using GIS, Geographic Information System, if I write an article on this, it can be a just pastime. For example, it can have the visualization of the data we know. It was first trial that is meaningful, but that was out of my curiosity. It was not linked to the finding of the new path of journalism. On the other hand, when I had the Nanguk report, I was looking at the structure of the poverty and the current status of the poor people many new things came out. So it was not the official starting of the data journalism, but I am proud to say that the Nanguk reporting that I did for the first time, to look at the data of the poverty in the neighborhoods as the first trial of the data journalism, I was able to see how deep the poverty was and how difficult the people's lives were using the data in the Nanguk area. So that was the report I can remember for long as the first case of the such reporting. Thank you. Second question, now we are still in the COVID era, right? So in relation to COVID-19, what is the biggest issue of the data journalism in relation to the COVID-19? Yes, for the generation of COVID-19 or era of COVID-19, so to speak, I've been to the US a, couple, a month ago. I was looking at the areas of the AR, VR, metaverse, and algorithm by meeting with experts in these areas. And COVID-19 is something related to the existence of the fourth industrial revolution. When we had the word of fourth industrial revolution, people argued whether this is really actual or not. But I'm sure that COVID-19 is accelerating the fourth industrial revolution. And the people who are just you know, facing the fourth industrial revolution in books are now realizing that it's in their lives. So the fourth industrial revolution has been 
cleared and also it has been more concrete. So what is the essence of the fourth industrial revolution? That is the data and AI. What kind of big data are we using? And also what kind of data we can get by making the systems learn through the machine learning and big data? What kind of results can we get? That's the homework we are being given because of the COVID-19. And at the same time, it's also an opportunity. Yes, thank you. We are seeing more and more questions. In order for the data journalism to function correctly, what kind of structures do we have to change? And also, in the newsroom, what kind of collaboration is expected amongst all the members in the newsroom? Also, in order to realize this, what kind of investment or decision making has to be made? And what difficulties are, can there be? And what, how can they go through the path? Yes, thank you. In the question about making it into an article, I am not an expert, so our moderator knows more about that than myself. So I just give the bucket to yourself. As a management person at the moment, I have to tell you this. Data journalism that we know of, for example, can give impact to the future of JTBC as the media as a whole. That's my concern nowadays. I've been recently appointed to the head of JTBC ever since then. I've been thinking about the new breakthrough of the media. So we have to think about the next generation of digital generation. Everyone is digital generation, but we have to know the post-digital generation. We have to know what kind of impact it can be. So the impact should not stay in one article only. The impact should go throughout the whole media, the whole broadcasting companies. So I'm sure that the impact will be felt by all those organizations. Having said that, what is new nowadays should be understood in what way. We have to continue to look at those things, but also we have to look at new things as well, like big data and algorithm that we see more recently from a couple of years ago, we have to connect it to the management of the media so that they can be prepared for the future. That's the work I'm doing right now. Of course, there's a limitation for any investment, for any decision making. Doing something unexpected or doing something that you have never done is fearsome. And also, even though you are not making a big jump, you have to be able to make visible result. That requires investment and people. For now, I have to tell you that in preparation for the new world created by the COVID-19 and by the fourth industrial revolution, we have to renew this data journalism so that it can become a momentum for developing the media further. And that's the framework we are making at the JTBC for the first time. Yes, thank you. You mentioned people, right? So in the JTBC, do you have any concrete plan for the people? So are you making new plans? Yes. We cannot hire so many people at a time, but probably we can start using the existing people and then we can add more people by hiring some more. We are planning to increase the size of our company that way. Yes, your presentation today has been talking about your experimental reporting that started about 20 years ago. You've been comprehending all these developments. Some have changed and some have not changed, I believe, because of the attributes and nature. So if you are interested in the data journalism out of the audience today, they must be very insightful. Thank you very much. In the next program we have is the part one, election and data journalism. So we will spend the morning for the data journalism in relation to the elections. And this part will be presided by me again. 
and also in the afternoon in the part two and part three we also have our designated moderators for them separately we now will invite Ms. Chang Silgi, data journalist of MBC, and Professor Park Chung Hee of Seoul National University. They're going to have the presentation together. When academy and journalists meet, they investigate polls. I'd like to give you the brief introduction of their bios. Professor Park Chung Hee is studying and teaching the international political relations in Seoul National University. He's also a time series expert as well as the data. And Ms. Chang Sil Ki is a journalist in MBC. And she is a graduate of Poll Lab of Seoul National University. And also she is a producer of many articles in that regard. Ms. Chang first. Good morning, my name is Chang Sil Ki, and today I'm going to talk about the meeting between the Academy and journalism. We are going to have the investigation onto the road. So we had our English title, When Journalism Meets Academia. You must have a hard time in listening to English so far. I'm going to have a very silly joke. You have the recollection of the movie when Harry met Sally, or when Coffee or Bagel as other two films. So both of them can be a recollection of yours, and these two things can meet together and can be pairs. And that's the analogy of mine to give you when journalism meets academia. Along with Professor Park Jung Hee, I am running the site. It's like the storyboard line, and also we have decoration in that sense. Currently, we are working on the presidential election for next year. We are trying very hard to show you as much as possible for the elections. Our efforts is exceeded your expectation, I have to say. So we are spending a lot of money as well for this site. There is one criticism that I can avoid. Probably. We are centering on the journalism, like a horse race. This is some kind of criticism we cannot avoid because we are making the popularity contained in the system. And also, rather than talking about the manifestos of the presidential candidates, we are trying to just run through the whole process, just like horse racing. We might be like the horses, according to many. The other reason for people say that this is like journalism, like horse race, also say that the media is also one part of the whole group, and media is also running and using the people's minds as well. So the raison d'etre of the media is now in crisis, I have to say. Therefore, my site, along with Professor Park, will be meaningful to avoid such criticism. Like in the past, not today people are saying that the poll is not accurate. So we also had extremes in this regard as well. Along with the NBC, we had this particular candidate research, which has had so many differences and variances according to the surveyors. The top one is company A, and the bottom one is company B. These two pollsters are doing the research and surveys according to the time frame. They are working on the same presidential candidate, Mr. Yoon sung Ryeol. As you see, the variations are so large, and nobody can believe what is going to stay. So that's what the general public says, that we are not convinced of polls at all. So the polls are done for these people, but polls are also done by the media. That's another source of criticism. And also, the, only this year, we had a lot of heated discussion about the roles of the polls. It's like the wagging the dog, and also you were just having the vicious circle coming up, the media polling together, and the polling is made by the media. This is a one vicious circle. So we have to go beyond this vicious cycle to see the real stories and real sentiment of the people by having the right selection of the polls in order to make polls believable and also trustworthy to the general public, we have our project. Korea is not the exception because other countries are doing the same things as well. Collaborations amongst academia and journalism are made by other countries as well. I was thinking in the beginning, can the journalism do this alone? 
But my answer to this question is that no, we cannot do this alone. Journalism itself is not so much convinced at the moment. Therefore, people do not believe what we say. Therefore, we need professors from the academia. Secondly, the gurus are quite important in making them believable. I told you that we are collaborating with the academia, with professors. We also have the company, NBC, for some kind of sites related to the political affairs. When we share the URL, so they say that, can we really trust what they say? This is NBC. I, tell, I say to you, you can trust it. This is very objective. Even though it's under NBC, you can believe what we say. So this is by the media, but media in itself is not so much powerful in terms of, of our convincibility. That's why we asked Professor Park to work together with us. Let's watch this, but bear with me a moment. So before we see the video, we have a BCM package, we'll say MCA pack. And uh, the person who helped us make this pack was Professor Park Jong-hee. And that's how journalism met academia. And doesn't that look just perfect? There we go. That's the page that I was looking for. So allow me to tell you how we've done this. So Real Meter on Monday and Gallup on uh, Friday and NBC on Tuesday conduct these kind of polling. And we take into consideration the regular polls uh, together with all polls that need to be registered at the National Election Survey Deliberation Commission. And these polls are about the assessment of presidential performance of President Moon. Uh, with regards to that, uh, they don't have to be registered at the National Election Survey Deliberation Commission, but we nevertheless included them. So, you know, once a week, uh, Korea Research would upload this poll, and other company or organization would upload this poll. And so we take data from these two sources, and my team collects the data, and data analysis is done by the academia or Professor Park jong -hee, and the content creation is done again by our team. So does it have a value as a coverage for it to be broadcasted every day? That's one question that we raised, and uh, the answer was no. No. So for NBC, um, CEO, uh, for NBC .co kr is the website that we published uh, these results. Uh, long form articles will be written online, or the outcome would also be broadcasted on a show called Predesk on YouTube. And during the elections, of course, it will be aired on TV. So data analysis is done by Professor Park Jong-hee. And he will come to the stage to tell us as to how he does this. But uh, let me just first tell you how we do data collection. So the data that comes to the commission is in this format. You see the figures that are highlighted in light blue, and those are recognized as image files, and so they're not machine readable. And they can't be even downloaded. So to write a mechanical code that would extract this was just so difficult to make. And we thought, you know, the manual way to do this would be the fastest way. So we input these figures manually today. And of course, there are some people who are skeptical about the manual way of doing things, but we haven't found an alternative yet. Then all polling organizations have a different uh, these tables that for us to input all of them in a mechanical way or through the machine is impossible because that means we would have to write 50 codes for each organization because there are 50 organizations. So that got us reluctant to write the code. So anyway, things are done manually at the moment. So if you look at the data that we collected, uh, they are this long. And these are just data pertaining to the assessment of presidential performance, and it's this long. 
And based on this Google spreadsheet, um, we exchanged data with Professor Park Chung Yi. So let me tell you how many we collected. So, so starting from May in 2017, when the Moon Administration was launched, uh, that was when we, so that's the date, uh, the earliest date of the data that we collected. And we have 1,301 assessments of presidential performance, and 1,177 data of level of support for the parties, and 463 and more data for level of preferences for presidential candidates. And as I said before, we have um, some data that are not registered within the National Election Survey Deliberation Commission. So maybe doing 1.5 times of this figure would be to give the accurate number of data that we are dealing with. And we have collected these uh, data. And um, this is as far as I can uh, disclose today. And we only disclose the specifics of the data to people who really need it. And as I said before, some of these opinion polls, uh, people don't trust them. So what we did was take into consideration of the trend of the polling uh, and also the inclination of these polling in, uh, organizations. And Professor Park jong hee will elaborate this. And he is the person who is most adept at Bayesian model here in Korea. And MCM pack is something that I'm sure that uh, all of you who are involved in Bayesian model have used and he partook in creating that package. And I knocked on his door several times for him to cooperate with us and it's an honor for me to work with him. So let's now invite Professor Park jong to the stage. It's a pleasure to meet you as introduced. Uh, my name is Park jong I'm a professor at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Seoul National University. I don't have a lot of time given to me, so I can't give you the specifics, but in this short amount of time, I will just give you an overview of what we're doing in terms of its methodology and background. And by using this methodology, what kind of analysis can we do? I think that's the most important part. You know, there are topics that we're really curious about and sensitive. And we can view them from different lenses, but I really think that uh, dynamic uh, linear regression, uh, uh, dynamic linear model, Bayesian dynamic linear model can be a help to that. And the uncertainties of the data and the models were accurately reflected in the answers. So our answers uh, are quite scientific. So the journalists and the academia have worked together to fire, find the most desired answer. And make polling data great again is the title of my presentation. And these days there's an increasing distrust towards opinion polls, which happens every at every election. The camps raise criticisms and the electorates raise criticism against these opinion polls, but rotten apples exist everywhere. And so wrong survey practices are prevalent, that's true. But what I want to tell you through this presentation is that when we look at the industry as a whole, the opinion polling that is done here in Korea is going towards a very desirable path. So I started this analysis back in 2012 when I came back to Korea. And there was a big event going on in Korea back then. You know, there was the presidential election and Park Geun-hye and Moon Jae-in were fighting against each other. And this is, is, a, this is the screen capture of the uh, analysis that was done in terms of the support level of those two candidates. And 0.517 was the difference between those two candidates, which would allow Park Geun-hye to win. So 
But if we were to collect all the candidates, and not just these two candidates, the figure was 0.516. But nevertheless, I thought that this would be very significant. And we dove into the analysis. And during the 2019 uh, elections, we conducted analysis together with Hangyeol newspaper. And depending on the opinion poll, uh, we predicted the outcome of the election in different uh, areas. And this reflects the outcome of the past elections as well as a number of population. So the closer it becomes to 45Y, the higher probability that this candidate has uh, in winning. And there were these graphs were highly accurate. And the outcome of uh, of Seoul, for example, was 53.67, and the error difference was only minus 0.66%. So these uh, election predictions can be very accurate using these methods because not only because pollings, the opinion polls are very accurate, but the people who actually answer these opinion polls and people who do make, who do take part in the elections are nearly the same. So that's why we have such accurate results. So of course, uh, there is hard work done by these polling organizations. But we also have to thank the Korean people who faithfully answer these surveys and actually cast their votes to the presidential candidates. So if you were to look at the opinion polls from the viewpoint of meta investigation, this is something that's been talked about widely these days. And many people are so increase, becoming increasingly interested in opinion polls. So meta investigation is about looking at the whole picture, looking at the entire survey. So many people are actually doing that uh, tacitly without maybe even knowing it. But anyway, so rather than looking at the individual's figures of an opinion poll, just look at the trends. And we would have to also take into consideration the surveys or opinion polls that are done uh, by these organizations instead of those ones that were commissioned by other organizations. And the mode of uh, investigation, is it ARS or is it a telephone call, is what makes the greatest difference in the outcome of the opinion poll. So taking these into consideration would enable you to filter out the noises in the outcome of the opinion polls. The other ones are a bit more context. You know, the many decisions made by different organizations impact the outcome of the opinion poll systematically. So these are all revealed through researches. And lastly, I would like to emphasize that like I said, these polling organizations carry out their own opinion polls, and sometimes they are commissioned to do these opinion polls. And the figure varies, of course, the, or the proportion varies. But if they are commissioned to do a certain poll, uh, polling, then who is the company that commissioned them? We need to figure that out. And what their relationship is. Does a certain company always commission this certain uh, polling organization without no with no particular reason? Then that could be a cause for a bias as well. So when conducting the analysis, we would use this kind of model. So with regards to candidate A, um, the opinion or survey organization I got commissioned from company J to conduct this uh, opinion poll We're using the methodology of K at a time T. So it's a very complex formula, but we have a, this formula of Y, I, J, K, T, and they do have bias, and we do take these biases into account and taking into consideration the outcome of the survey we would reflect them in the model. So there will be the effect by the uh, polling organization I and effect added by the company that commissioned this polling, J. And there must be an effect in play uh, in terms of the interaction between I and J. 
And what is the methodology? Is it a telephone call or is it an ARS? So the survey methodology could provide, become a variable or could come into play. And there is something called the menu effect. I'm going to talk about this uh, in the later part of my presentation. And lastly, what's in blue is that we need to look at the trends in the opinion poll, which I did in my work with MBC. This can filter out the noise. And so the, how, how this talks about how the trends in the public opinion changes. Um, and what's in purple is that all these values are not fixed, but they change consistently. So there is a random noise in the distribution. We must take that into account. So the survey organization effect has already been uh, investigated by many researchers across the world. And there is something also called menu effect. So depending on what candidate is in or not in the picture, the outcome of the survey can change. And that needs to be taken into consideration. And the company that commissioned this survey, what kind of effect do they have in place? So depending on who commissioned this poll, the outcome of the poll can change greatly. And that also needs to be taken into consideration. So if we are to filter out the noise, how would that look like? So this is a graph showing the assessment of presidential performance with regards to President Moon Jae-in, a positive assessment. So the, this is called a net approval rating. And as you can see, the public can change their opinions in this given time frame, and that can change the outcome of the election. So as you can see, the assessment is still in the negative area today. And uh, this is the survey frequency. So there is. So we say that if it goes, oh, I'm sorry, from Lee Jae-myung, I'm sorry, the candidate Lee Jae-myung. And if it goes near 30%, uh, the candidate would have higher chance of winning the presidential election. And for the past two to three years, uh, Kim, uh, Lee Jae-myung has gone from 10% to 30%. And with regards to Lee na in June, uh, January of 2021, his support rating fell, but if you look at this, at the starting from mid-2020, his support has been falling already, and we see that change continuing to 2021. And with regards to Yoon song yeol he was not part of the presidential candidate, but he's become one very recently, and he has a high support. And uh, you can see that his graph is steeping up. So like I said before, we have eliminated the noises in these graphs to reflect the opinions of the public. And now for Hong Junpyo, it's very interesting. He has shown some low support level until very recently, but the graph uh, climbed up at a very steep uh, angle, as you can see. So he is rapidly gaining the support of the public. So I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to raise some short questions. So whether it's ARS or telephone call, if we are to look at these methodologies separately, then what kind of different trends can we find? With regards to Lee Jae-myung, the blue is telephone call and red is ARS. As you can see, um, you know, they have remained around the same, and now it's about 2 to 3% difference to the ARS. And telephone call don't really show a lot of differences. And with regards to Ina again, the outcome is around the same. Of course, there were times when the telephone call had higher support rate, but uh, it's about the same. But with regards to Yun Song Yeol, candidate Yun Song Yeol. As I pointed out before, the ARS methodology far exceeded the support level of the 
uh, telephone call support rate. So who needs to answer who needs to answer this i think it is the polling organizations who have accountability in making clarifications for this and as for hong junpyo yes ars is a bit higher but there's no big difference and these two methodologies show have shown similar patterns but recently uh, they have shown some bit differences and ARS methodology is the one that has shown some a higher level of support, and the gap is pretty big. So I hope that the organization will also address this. So now, if we are to look at the effect of the methodology of the survey, so. So if you look at the support of Yoon song yeol it's overly uh, assessed, whereas uh, also that's the case for Lee na in terms of ARS. And if we look at the telephone, uh, the Lee na is the one who is excessively assessed. But as you can see, most of the uh, candidates remain at the 95% credibility level. So compared to telephone call, ARS has greater bias and that actually that bias is shown especially in some candidates and this is this should be explained not by the camps of these candidates but the uh, polling organizations the re now let's look at the presidential support level so telephone call is at a higher rate than ARS and that trend was strong recently, but these days there is hardly any difference. Oh, why is that? The why is the bias that does not exist uh, with regards to the president uh, appearing with regards to presidential candidates? So we need clarification for that. So house effects and client effects, I would like to explain them very briefly. So as you can see, there's a great gap between the polling organizations and what needs to be taken into consideration is that you know, we don't know whose outcome will be the closest to the actual presidential election outcome. So you know, that was the case in the United States. So, so there is no true value yet. But how come there is so much differences in the outcome of the survey in ca case of specific organizations? They need to address this issue. In case of Yoon Seok Yeol, the difference, as you can see, is great. Uh, compared to other candidates. Well, it could be that Yun, it's because you know, Yoon Sung Yeol has just joined the political circles, and maybe that's attributable to this kind of great gap, but we will really have to address this. As for the manual effect, red refers to the benefit that other candidates receive when a certain candidate drops out of the race and so on. So I don't have details to describe the picture. And I will conclude my presentation in a minute. So then what about the two-way race investigation? You know, you know, we would put Lee Jae-myung as part of the survey and include uh, other candidates uh, to see uh, the outcome of the competition between the two candidates. So now let's look at the competition between Lee Jae-myung and Yoon seong yeol As seen earlier in some specific polling organizations, uh, we see some figures that really stand out. But if you look at the range of the x-axis in case of Yoon seong yeol I'm sorry, I can't see this closely, but we see these values that have a big difference compared to the values of other or polling organizations. But instead of uh, large size organizations or organizations that have had close relationship with these uh, candidates for a long time, it is usually the organizations that were commissioned by small scale companies that have shown these uh, differentiating figures. So that was something that was worth noting. And with regards to competition between Hong Junpyo and Lee Jae-myo, Again, they were some uh, figures uh, that differed greatly uh, from the figures of other companies. 
So based on the data collected by MBC and of course the responses of the public and by using statistical models, we were able to conduct many analyses to see such trends and we would like to provide a guidance to the polling organizations so that they would guide the public in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. From now on, we'd like to have the Q&A session to show you how collaboration has been made between the academia and journalism. This kind of collaboration is actually not new. It has been old, but there are challenges as well in doing this. So can we also show our PPT to the audience as well? Now, the question number one. This goes to Professor Park. Professor Park has been doing this job along with the journalist media. I believe that you must have faced some challenges. Can you explain what kind of challenges have you experienced in dealing with the collaboration with the journalism media like us? Yes. Basically speaking, I believe that the journalism and academia have different approaches to deal with the data and analysis. The journalism is also requires accuracy as well as the fast speed. However, the academicians like me and the university are quite lazy. So we want to be accurate as much as possible. That's our very good, good excuse. And if we want to just speed up our processes, we believe that there can be some kind of errors of the coding and so on. Therefore, we are just collaborating to meet in the halfway. No matter what automation we are using for the coding, in our analysis, we have outliers, we have coding errors, and other unexpected problems and glitches. Every time we meet with these problems, we have to be very agile in dealing with the issues. The academicians are less trained in terms of dealing with the fast speed. So we had trials and errors in this regard. However, having said that, I believe the collaboration is needed and important only because of that as well. Because the media really wants to be objective and accurate but their wish is not so much met. And also, they can be complemented by the academicians like us in order to have more accuracy as well in the future. So collaboration is quite more needed in the future as well. Let me go on. In the case of journalism and media, we have our challenges dealing with the academicians. I was going to say this. In the time of the journalism and the time of the academicians, our time gifts are too much. We are different because the journalism is running so fast and we are running around while the academicians are just you know, stable. We have to be nimble in terms of the posting our articles faster than anybody else. So it's kind of competition of time. So as you said before, you know, by using academicians, we can have the safety breaks as well. Also, we have our chances to discuss these matters with the other people who are most robust in their ideas. So we were able to have the insights from the academicians. If we want to call it a collaboration, this kind of collaboration should be made in the halfway, as you said, in terms of timing. It will mean some sacrifice by both sides. Probably we have derivative question. Then the next page, it's kind of like storm in the cup. It's like the males in their 20s. That can be a social phenomena. This is quite in a phenomenal graph here. So can we really trust this? Like the blue line, which are the males in their 20s, they, do, they, do they really behave very egoistically if they are rich? because they say they do not want to make donations when they are very rich. This kind of results of this graph, and it can be a result of the miscommunications or the lack of understanding. What do you think about that? Before talking about this graph in more detail, I would like to sh tell you that this is a disaster of outsourcing. For example, a special or particular company can be specialized in the legal affairs that can be 
commissioned by a company. And if there is a commitment of the legal matters, that there must be a group or a department of the legal processes in the company. So if a journalism media is responsible for this kind of graph and then outsourcing these projects from other third party companies, and they have to be responsible for the processing and also getting the interpretation of the data. If they had the department specialized for the analysis of the raw data, they would not have this kind of disaster. I believe this is a disaster of the outsourcing because there was not a department in the company to have the interpretation of the raw materials. And also the company was very you know, free from the responsibility because the raw material providers were in the censor uh, the criticism so the old professors providing this raw material was in the, the in the hot seat the problem i find here is as follows it sometimes is talked about that there was a intention of this craft to demonize the males in their 20s i don't know and i cannot have any say about this but i want to say that the only thing I can tell you is that there was a misunderstanding of the raw data from this collection. And then also there was no raw data in the teenagers of the males. They should not have any dots here. But they put the dots here anyway. And why is that? We have to know why is that they just want to have the streamline of these whole graph. And we had the second thought about this graph. When we did the second model, actually, it was no different from this because they did not, did not have the dots for the 90s. And also, we have to talk about the confidence interval. And why is confidence interval important? It's because it can deliver the accuracy the best way to make it more convincible. So the default should not be omitted if you really want to have the high degree of the confidence interval. So confidence interval should be included in any kind of graph. Yes, thank you. So in the poll dash MBC dash poll actually has the confidence interval included. That was kind of advertisement for all the audience. One thing I regretted a lot about looking at this graph of the males in their 20s as a novice reporter might be very difficult for the novice reporter to have a clear understanding of the graph. In that case, that novice, gra novice reporter can ask questions to the experts like professors and so on. I didn't know what happened behind the scene, so I cannot say more. But there can be some t times when there is no overlapping interest between the journalism and the academicians. For example, they can disagree and disagree. For example, regressive analysis is very difficult to be broadcasted, and I believe that this is the, the most difficult one that can be carried on the terrestrial television. The broadcasting means that everything is just you know, flipping away very quickly, so we were not able to be thorough about checking everything before carrying them on the television. So we have some improvements to make. But before putting it on the program, there must have been some kind of checking system or finer checking system so that they can be proven to be true. And as Professor Park said, you know, without confidence in turbo, it cannot be trusted. That's the comment we can make before the finer t moment of making it into the program. So this is not about the who's winning and who's losing, because you know, we are just you know, showing that you know, this is something that we really showed others. And it is very difficult to convince the bosses of the television. And also, it is very difficult to make the consensus. But this kind of making consensus is our homework to do in the future, both the journalism and the academicians. So another question, is it good to have a collaboration? Do you think so? Yes, of course, I think collaboration is good. So the journalism needs academia, and academia also needs journalism. 
and data-based information will be increasingly used in news reportings going forward. So the academia would have to find a way for the readers to easily understand and also to make sure that the outcomes are supported by scientific grounds. And of course, we need the materials, we need the data. A lot of scholars are always hungry for materials and data. And so the media can really provide us with quality data. And you know, through data, we can re, uh, attain credibility. So I believe that uh, the collaboration in these two disciplines will increase in the future. So it's the same for journalism as well, because we have to uh, put out stories that differentiates ours from that of others. But we face limitations in doing that. We have limited thoughts, you know, and so on. So. We would collaborate with not only academia, but also civil society and so on to get help. But as you said, we don't need to, we do not ha need to develop an attitude that the academia is working for us, but we are working in partnership. So maybe there are some parts where not journalism, but academia could take lead in, which might produce some more quality stories. So that was just a self-introspection on my part or the journalism's part. So that's the end of our talk. And we will address uh, some questions later in the Q&A session. So that was when journalism meets academia pulling the polls. So that was Chang Seulgi, journalist at NBC, and Professor Park jong at Seoul National University. We enjoyed your presentations and talks. We also have another presentation for this session one about the case of election report. And a journalist at Newstapa will tell us how election report has been done at Newstapa, especially based on the analysis of voting propensity by voting district. And the presentation will be given by Ms. Yeon Da He. And let me just tell you who she is very briefly. In 2016, uh, she joined Newstapa as data journalist. And uh, she has conducted uh, many projects like the taxation issue and corruption in the National Assembly, and she has also been involved in many investigative reports that are based on data. And other than that, she has conducted online education on data journalism at Newstapa. So now let's listen to her presentation. Good morning. As was introduced, my name is Yeon Jahe from Newstapa. I'm going to give you the example of the election reporting, which was the analysis of the propensities of the election by district. I have a question to you. When you receive a calendar for the next year, what do you do for the first time? I'm checking when is the election day of the year after. As a reporter, election is quite important event, maybe the most important thing for the reporters to cover. And, I, and then I look at when is the local elections and by elections and so on. So if I am working for an election team, I will be more meticulous about this. But even if I'm not working for for the election team, I'm always careful to look at the schedules of the elections. I've been working as a reporter for six years so far. Every year, we had some sort of elections. And also, every year, we were kind of making preparations for covering elections, in other words. Any journalist would agree that this is a quite important event. I'm talking about the elections. So when we talk about the articles and elections, you will have the recollections of the polls, approval rate, and so on. As time goes by, you will be also interested in the articles about the property of the candidates' age and the number of terms elected. And also after the election is finished, we have ballot counting broadcast as well. They also have a lot of speeches and the policy debates and mentioned at the social network. We can also use the GIS system to know where they are going in terms of the local electioneering. Election is full of data, and it is quite a good source of data. In this regard, 
I always have our ongoing question, what do we have to do? What does News Tapa has to do as an independent media? This year, I was not involved in the election team. I didn't have to write an article about election. However, if after an election is finished, every attention is given to an election. When I was preparing for my job, I always thought that I was not doing my job properly. So sometimes I felt uneasy about this. And then in the meantime, I was able to witness my condition. I had all the data for the candidates. The news top I did not have the markman, did, did not cover the sites, and did not have any results of the exit poll results. In that sense, what can we do? And this is the article as a result of our agony, as our status. So we were looking at the data from the poll stations in the 20th general election. And that data was also a source of our further analysis. And the next day after we had the update of the data in each poll station, and then we had an, another round of rearranging the data by polling station. So this is the result of our articles about the election. And number one is the number one polling station in the Hyundai department in Apguzhong area, and also that is located in the Gangnamgu area. Out of the candidates, Mr. Oh Sehun, as a candidate for this mayor of Seoul City, received the most ballots, while Mr. Park Young Sun, the candidate from the Democratic Party of Korea, had only 100 ballots. That was like in the 17 times of the ballots to be given to the Oh Sehun. Let's look at another analysis. That's the comparison of the 21 polling stations, which has the most the ballots for Osehun. So this is a list of the apartments, and these are very expensive, high-rise buildings where the wealthy people are living. So you will know all the names of these buildings. But these areas, they have the number one, number two, number three, and number four ballot stations. They all have the higher number for the, the Osehun candidate, while Ms. Park did not have the match of the ballots here. So this gap between the two candidates is only the 12.3 percent. However, Osehun received much more ballots than in than Park. And that was the 17 times as witnessed in Hyundai apartment, as I talked before. That is wider gap than in the average of the Seoul. And also, Sehun in the 20th, 20th next general election, he was high, flying high and 1,449 stations. And also, when he was winning for the Democratic Party, the opposition had the 16 point percent difference from the winning party. This time in the 20th by election, the pendulum has waved to the other direction when the DPT was winning only in 15 places while the PPP was winning in 1,450 stations. It means that the popularity has just gone from the other right way around. The biggest difference comes from the Songbuk district. And in 2020, the, the Democratic Party was winning with 12.4 percent point, while in 2021, they lost by 19.2 percent point. Kirim area, which is the apartment field areas, Kirim New Town Lemian, Kirim New Town E. Penan Sesang are the apartment buildings that are most representative here, and they show the strength very dramatically. And also, the smallest variance can be observed in these three districts, and the Gumcheonggu, Junggu, and Dobonggu are them, but they are also showing less than 20 percent of point of the variance. But they did not show any movement from the the, uh, for, to, toward the Democratic Party. Out of 2,200 polling stations, they moved to the PPP by more than 10 percent point. Actually, April 19th and 2019, they showed that there is an increase of the apartment up price by 14.75 percent as released by the Ministry of Land Prices. 
And the land price was going up while the apartment buildings are also getting more expensive, of course. The three areas, Yangcheon, Gangnam, and Yeongdungpo, are the ones that showed the highest jump. And also for the communal residential buildings in Seoul, they also had the increase of the prices by 14.75%. And then they also have the generated more tax payment. And also the Osehun was also very seen visible in these most wealthy areas in Gangnam and Seocho by 20%. So this is the correlation to show you the real estate price buildings and the election popularity. That is the correlation of the 0.9. And that is also seen here. So in Gangnam area, the Osehun is quite popular and those areas are quite visible. And they can be proven in here. However, interpretation is another thing because you know, it's not so easy to have the full understanding. There must be some people who have moved to other party, and also th some of the voters might have experienced the increase of their prices, and some of them might have experienced the sacrifices because of the land price they, they couldn't afford. And also they have to have their own the ownership of the households to show the trend. But for the journalists like us, it is very difficult for us to know who's owning the house, who's not. For the vo voters, they can always say that they are angry about not having the subsidy from the government. But without proof, we cannot write those stories on the newspaper. And also, we have to look into the details of this data. Like, for example, every district and every man. And also, we can say that we are witnessing some of the sentiment toward the opposition party. That's the only thing we can say. Now, this is another example of showing you what kind of processes we are making for having a report. It took me about two or four, two, up to four months to write one article normally. But this article is an exception because it took only one day for me to write up. How was it possible? In News Tapa, the, what is the most important thing is to amass the data. It's more important than writing a, a story. We don't know whether this would be important for us, useful for us down the road. Without carrying that, we are just collecting and collecting the data. We call it archive. This archive is a pool of the collection, control, sharing, and use of the raw data by the members of the data team. We are just amassing all these things. So this is a source of writing this kind of article. So this is an example. I wrote up this article at the end of last year after an election. We did not have the information about the district called like Tong or Pan. We were just using the publicly available data only. Then we just were trying to confirm that these residents were actually the voters. And we moved ahead by having the idea of writing up this kind of story based on the data we had. So we asked for the release of the data to the district authorities to have the residences. But as a result of the, our, our asking and requesting, Kwanaku said that they did not have the data. So they gave us the notice of non-existence of data. Didn't make sense at all. Instead, they showed us this one. And after one year, the person who answered me from the Kwanak district was fired, and he was replaced by someone else to give me some kind of raw data. Now I was, was able to write up this story because I was able to get the data from the district. This is the way we were able to amass all the data in 25 districts in Korea. We were able to purify the data to write a story. And we were sharing all the data, so it took only one day. And also, as a result of the election, we were able to combine all the data and then share the data for our articles. So I told you that it took only one day to write a story. But behind that, we had a one full years of processes going through. So journalist Kim kwang Yun and I were analyzing the data on the election day. On the next day, we were able to have the coverage. And we were just a team of two. That is why we were able to achieve that in one day. After getting the coverage, we were also getting a lot of the 
reactions. So the questions from the re readers included, like, you know, where are the, all the supporters of Ha Gyeong Yang? Where did they go? And who's getting the others, other ballots from the female 20s? And also 15.5% of the, was the number for the males, females in their 20s. And at that time, it was not quite noticeable because you know, we were not exposed to the female data before. And I was interested in that as well. So in preparing for this, I was looking at this because of my curiosity. Ha Gyeong Young as a candidate, he was just you know, scattered all over. And also you know, Park Gyeong-sung was also you know, leading the king. You know, so we get the feedback. and. Also so the next day, I was thinking that we have to check it more thoroughly. I was not thinking of having an, another article, but on the lunchtime the next day, I was looking into the old 25 districts for the female candidates and who was voting for them. And I was able to see a very particular trend of these voters for the female candidates, like 1.91% of the voters combined were ex exhibited by five candidates. And we had the 12 areas where the voting ratio was more than 6%, which is the three times bigger. And that area was actually full of campuses, especially the women's uh, universities like Yihua and Tsukde. And also the Kim Jin Hua as a, Kim Jin Ah as a candidate, she showed a very particular popularity in the areas where the female, the women's universities are there. Also in Sung Myung Suk is another female candidate and she got the ballots more than 1% in Kwanaku and Yongjung Poku. They are not having the campuses but they have the population of less than 30 years old. So as you see here, all these areas where many young people are residing, they relatively voted more for the female candidates. And also, there was only one place where university is not there. That is the number three voting station in Sangamdong in Mapoku. They took about 33.5% of the young people, but they didn't vote for the female candidate that much. If I didn't know about the neighborhood, I wouldn't be able to write this story. I looked at the map, and that's full of a lot of office tales, like Sangam office tale, and so on. I was able to know what the neighborhood was like because I was living there. I was one of the residents there like for three years. I knew what the neighborhood was like. So they were living we um, amongst uh, other females in their 20s and 30s. I was very confident to carry that article. So after you know, writing all the stories, and I had my, our story. I showed you how I was able to write a story. This is not something particular. This is not so much a sophisticated one. We don't have that much data. But sometimes people say that the value for in, in money is not good for this uh, article writing. And if you spend one month for a one article, you might say this is correct. But if I was able to make a story one day like I did, you cannot say that the value for money is not so low. So Newstopper does not have markmen. Newstopper doesn't send people to the sites. But still, we were able to do something like this. I was able to witness that I could do that. Thank you very much for sharing the idea with me. Thank you very much. That was Ms. Yondahe from Newstapa. And she was also presenting us about the popularity trend of the elections by district. By listening to her, we also received many questions from the chat box on the YouTube. Some of the questions are quite in depth, I find. Probably it would have been not easy to ask such questions. Originally, our intention is to use the Q&A session to have the interactions with the audience. If they ask questions, we can continue our Q&A session. But before we do that, why don't we just have our general discussion together. While doing so, while listening to our discussion, the audience can also put in their questions. In the meantime, as well, we will come back to you later. 
while we were talking, I also received new questions. So it's something like this. In the journalism, the, the bias can be observed in some of the polling station companies. In order to prevent that from happening, what kind of measures should be made? Professor Park should also mention other usages of the Bayesian statistics stat, models for statistics in order to avoid that. And I was able to see the variance of all the different polling companies. We were able to see the big variance, much bigger variance than normal amongst all the polling stations. Sometimes it's embarrassing. So as mentioned, the results are seemingly based on the bias. In order to improve that problem of bias, what can we do? <coughs> so this is not an easy problem because it's a political issue, first of all. But for the scholars, that's not a problem because scholars like us criticize everyone and everything. But just because there is a bias or a gap, do we can we really objectively say that that is wrong? That's not easy. So what the U.S. does is called 538. So based on the election outcome, they would give scores like A, B, and C, and D. And they also have gave F to the companies who refuse to provide the materials and they're not included in the meta investigation. And every time these polling companies uh, announce their outcome, they are to publish the scores right next to the outcome. So I think I can give you two suggestions today. First, so we need to basically give an accurate view of the floating voters. So you will have to not only give the uh, figures for each candidate, but also the floating voters. And we need to make sure that uh, these organizations also compete for the floating voters. So when a candidate is confirmed in a certain party and when there are some political changes, uh, we have this, uh, you know, insight knowing how the floating voters will change. So by knowing specifically about these floating voters, we can reduce the bias. And the uh, pollings that are done today are based on the assumption that everyone in the nation will take part in the election. And with together with the exit uh, poll, uh, we will have to combine that with the predictive service to get a more out accurate outcome. So the only way that a polling organization can say that their figure is accurate is to announce that predictive survey on the day of the election. But I believe that has not been the case so far. And such practices that I suggested would have to be adopted by the polling companies. And you know, we have these small polling organizations uh, joining uh, the polling opinion, op opinion polling polls today, and they are not free from the suggestions that I raised. So again, uh, make sure you provide the details of the floating voters and your, the outcome of your predictive survey would have to be published on the day of the election so that the public can make the decisions of their own. So you talked about two things or talked about you, your answer was in two aspects. So the polling organizations and their methodologies would have to be more transparent. In terms of the floating voters, they would have to be uh, provided in a clear manner. And uh, you did meta-investigation with regards to your research. And what Ms. chang sung said in her presentation is the graph about men in their 20s. And I believe that that was based on a logistic regression analysis. But you are using a Bayesian model. It's a sophisticated statistical tool. 
So the viewers and the readers would have some difficulties in understanding the outcome of these models. And with regards to the academia and journalism cooperating, I believe you needed to engage in a lot of communication. So based on the presentation, I think the analysis of the model and the data analysis was all done by Professor Park, right? And the one who collected the data and material and organized them was done by Ms. Chang Sergi at NBC. That was my understanding. And so opinion polls are based on the assumption of uh, the uh, those who will participate in the poll, and this is impossible. It's something that only God knows, I believe. But this meta-analysis technique that you are using so uh, there, you know, there are many organizations do have their own bias. Yes, that's true. But when we look at the bigger picture, can we say that those are offset? Yes, he says yes. So speaking of transparency, you talked about it. So from that perspective, if we want to be sure that this is really accurate, and that's based on our trust. However, still, this is a very complicated model. Depending on who's looking at this, it looks like a black box, sort of. Of course, we have to understand the insights of the model only after getting some education. There will be a handful of people Taking it as a basics, maybe you can just explain a little bit more briefly to talk about what you're using. You're using R, and also you are also uh, giving some chances of letting us know. So I, I think that some US companies are releasing the insights as well. So are you planning to do so? Are you planning to open your codes? Yes, we, it might be possible. So when we had analysis of the Sewol Ho, the ship sinking accident, we also had our raw materials code giving to the data sense, and that's a data birth. And data birth is the area where we are providing all the raw materials. It's like in a based on the GitHub. And also, the code issues do not have the protocols yet to follow. In my case, while writing up my article or my thesis, I am just releasing my codes. So if you read my article, you can know my sources of the data. And also, we have our uses of this data and the journalism as well. I am willing to open my data and the GitHub. Even if it's today, I can do that. And also in 2017, when I also wrote another paper, I explained in detail about the metrics of the codes. So I, you're right when you said it's very complicated, and people say that it's not transparent. But actually, believe me when I say it's not that complicated. Andre Gelman in Columbia University used the same model when he was predicting the results of the election. And ASIS was also using the system. In, and also, the five Jack men was also using the same model in Australian elections. So there are the dynamic linear model of Bayesian statistics. And I was only just adjusting it to fit the Korean, stand, Korean uh, situation to have the more zero target, zero point adjustments. I'm based on the internationally proven or accredited systems. That's all I can say. Well, thank you. Since we are talking about this issue, we have some more questions related to that. While talking about the reports of NBC, Ms. Chang Silgi can answer this question from the chat box. How do you verify the polls research and surveys in NBC? So that's the question. It's very difficult to answer that question because poll NBC 
and our separate uh, investigations that are done in the political team and so are, are separated. So I don't really know what's going on in the political team, but if I were to focus on poll MBC, yes, I'm creating that together with Professor Park Jong-hee to pull the polls. And so you use the word bias. So the biases or the differences, we really wanted to eradicate them to make sure that we would clear the understanding of the public reading these data. And but what I do want to tell you from the viewpoint of journalism is that I wish that we would draw the graphs well. So, you know, for example, you know, he said that we have to make clear reports about people whose candidacy has not been confirmed yet, but we would give these kind of percentages to certain uh, candidates and you usually choose the top two candidates with the top percentages and ignore the other candidates. But the differences between the two candidates, yes, it is important, but we also need to know information about other candidates as well, but those are not expressed in the graphs and they're not read by audio by the reporters and it's not reflected in the news articles and so on but the so a selective uh, reporting of information value is not a good thing I believe and those things that are not reflected in the graph are very important because if it's like a two-way competition graph then a lot of it it's uh, distorted so you know usually like for example they only take up 80 percent of the entire picture but we, the graphs reflect as if they take up the 100% of the picture, for example. And the readers might just see and think that, oh, so those two candidates are the only ones that matter. So we really need to be careful in drawing these graphs. And people who are in charge of uh, these polls are direly needed in the press. So maybe there are people in charge at the uh, political team, but they are ex level ex they're not experts in uh, these polls. So when we design the survey, Survey and when we receive the survey, we would just rely on the uh, poll organizations, you know, give them commissions, as we said before, and to see what, percent, uh, what percentages of level of support is for people in different age groups, for example. And when I made a request to our partner company for raw data, they responded with, what? What do you want? And they were surprised because, you know, it's not a common practice for us to ask for raw data, for example. So I hope that there is a dedicated personnel at media companies for polls, and especially people who know about analysis and about data, then that would facilitate a smooth conversation. And Professor Park has raised this concern as well. And so maybe some at the political team uh, has an expertise in this, but I really want to have someone who have expertise joining our team. And Cho uh, Bo is the only one, I believe, who has a, a dedicated person doing that. But anyway, opinion polls is very important. So maybe if we can't invite experts uh, to the press, then maybe we can give education and training to our existing employees. And the reason why people say is that these opinion polls are wrong is because we do have a uh, time period where uh, the publication of our survey poll is limited or restricted. So what happens over a period of a week or two weeks during which the publication is forbidden uh, is not reflected in the survey poll. That's what makes people think that we are wrong, that we have made a mistake. And you know, the people who take part in the survey and people who actually take part in the election may be different people with different attributes. But uh, and you know, and sometimes so the survey figures might seem preposterous. But at the day of the election, we actually see that they're close to the actual outcome. So when we assess uh, our um, opinion poll, uh, not during elections, but for other events, uh, we will have to uh, compare them with the uh, population. 
Yeah, I do believe that people who take part in the survey and also who take part in the AR survey and telephone survey are people who are likely to actually cast their votes during the election. So yes, ARS can be correct, but of course it can be wrong. But I don't really like to use the word bias. I, you know, the recipe for. Uh, you know, different food is different, and depending on how much chili pepper or chili sauce that you put in, the level of spiciness changes in a dish. And I think opinion polls can be viewed in that light. So, of course, uh, more number of us would have to assess these opinion polls and their outcomes, but I think we need to make reports on the literacy instead of just using the word bias going forward. So there is a lot of ties in the uh, opinion polls. And uh, anyway, so the opinion polls are bound to be the topic of controversy even going forward. So the media will have to play a greater part in uh, calming down those controversies, I believe. Uh, thank you very much for your input. And you said you like to use a different word than the word bias. So, but anyway, it's a statistical term, and that's why we're using the word bias. And you know, when the electorates and the readers, but when they hear the word bias, maybe they would get a different nuance of the term. And we also have different questions being raised uh, via YouTube. So now it's for News Tapa, Miss Yandahe. So in case of Newstopa, it is investigative reporting media. So in normal days, you might have some long-term view in your investigative report. But when it comes to election, it might be different because you have to be also fast as well like other media. So in case of coverage of the election, what is the top priority of Newstopa? Yes. News Stop, as you know, is investigative reporting media. We have a long-term plan for an article. Actually, in election as well, we are doing the investigative reporting as well for a longer term. The reporting I talked about today, it took only one day. It is an exception, so it might, you might feel different. But we are also very much investigative and also taking long time in the election. We are not covering the behaviors and actions actions of the candidate every day. We're not following them at all, so we cannot know what they're talking about and what they're doing. That is kind of a limitation to us, but at the same time, it can be an advantage as well. Our problems can be complemented by having earlier planning. For example, in the National Assembly, we also had the reporting of the text analysis of the releases by the National Assembly. In the local elections, we have also the analysis of the jobs in combination with other jobs for the candidates. It covered 3,300 candidates as well. So there's something we only can do. So we are trying to do some things that other media cannot cover. Thank you. So we have the remainder of the time, which is very less, but the number of questions is much big, bigger than the number of minutes we have. Professor Park, when you do the analysis by polling station, you might have the effect of the organization. You have it as a K effect. So in your own modeling, Probably you have to factor into the modalities of each of the poll stations and also the treating the non-answers. So these details are reflected on it as variables. How to do the weighting as well? I don't do the weighting at all. I only put the names of the organizations of the polling and the methodology in the name of the registered to other companies. And also, when they reported to the newspaper, we are taking their data as they are. And we are, have our internal coding. So we don't put any weighting from these polling stations. The only exception is that when we have the prediction in the National Assembly, as we did, if we have the cross table given to us, probably we can see the ratio of the age from here. And also, the ratio of age is different when it comes to actual voting. That's why we put a little bit of weighting 
at that time, but for other regular jobs, we don't do waiting at all. Yes, the time has elapsed, and this is you know, the, almost the end of our session. So really, elections are called the highlight of democracy or the flower of democracy. But there are, as you mentioned in your presentations, many variables that come into play in the elections. But we are making various attempts driven by data. And we're going through many trials and errors to produce better stories. And I'm sure we can make further improvements going forward. So Professor Park jong hee journalist Chang seok and journalist Yeon Dae-hae. So data-driven reports is the work that you have done to date. And you have given us some food for thought uh, as to how we can deal with um, uh, our stories on election based on these data-driven information. And that concludes part one. And I would like to thank everyone uh, for raising your questions during the Q&A session. And we will have lunchtime now, and part two will begin at 1 p.m. So please enjoy your lunch, and thank you very much once again. Good afternoon. This is the Data Journalism Korea Conference 2021 Part 2. My name is Hwang Hyun Jung, and I belong to the Digital Communication Research Center at Congo University. We now like to begin the Part 2 of the conference, Data Journalism Tech and Method. Then we will now invite the moderator for part two, Ms. Choi Jin Soon, who is the journalist at the Korea Economic Daily. Please give her a big hand. Hello. As introduced, my name is Choi Jin Soon from the Korea Economic Daily. So I have the honor of being the moderator for this session. So the topic of this session is data journalism tech and method. And allow me to introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Mr. Chu Jae-sun, CEO of Speechlog. So he uh, majored in visual design. And he is well versed in the game market. And he established the Korean language school in China, in Namgyeong. And the title of his presentation is How to Analyze and Utilize News Data Focusing on Speech and the Speakers. Hello. As introduced, my name is Chu jae -sun. I'm the CEO of Speechlog. So Speechlog is a company that records words or speeches. So although we're not a media company or reporters, thank you for inviting me and my company to give presentation at this conference. So we extract speech and speakers from news data and see how we can make use of them. Then allow me to explain what we do in detail. So the order of my presentation is introduction and what we can find out through the data that is extracted from speech and the speakers. And through these extracted data, we are conducting some pro projects, and I would like to introduce them. One project is about establishing a people's dictionary, and another project is analyzing the competitiveness of presidential candidates. And I would like to also give you some use cases. So all news comes from speech. Since September 1st to 31st in 2021, so for a period of a year, we included around 91 media companies, including central daily newspapers and so on. And we took a closer look at them uh, in terms of their political economy, international culture, and social articles. And among them, 94% of them included speeches. Only 6% did not include any speech. And the extracted speech data was about 800 
58,138. So in other words, most of the news that are published here in Korea stem from the speech that we make. So based on these extracted speech in news, uh, we thought about how we can make use of them. So from media, broadcast, and communication, we extracted the speech data, and we categorized them into their contents, the speaker, issues and keywords, the timeline, and the media, and the journalist. And so we, in other words, expanded the data and reestablished it. And once we reestablished the data, we were able to develop a new lens through which we saw society. We were able to compare the speakers and gauge the power of the message of the speaker, their impact on certain issues, the issues flow, and who, uh, the person who actually makes those issues or the issue, who the mission makers is and uh, what kind of uh, related keywords are deemed important to those speakers and what share or the percentage that they take up in terms of an issue and people's response as well. So through the speech data and speaker data, we conducted some analysis. So let me tell you about that analysis and what we can find from those analyses. So we have about eight themes under this part one. And other than these eight themes, uh, other types of analysis can, of course, be added here. So first, we can compare policies and certain issues between speakers based on the analysis. So when we compile certain speeches made by a certain individual on an issue, we can figure out what kind of attitude or perception this person has about that certain issue. Um, so this is a data ranging from September 21st to October 4th. And this is about the speeches made by presidential candidates Lee Jae-myung and Lee na -kyun on real estate. And so based on that, we try to see what their policies on real estate is and uh, how they approach this issue. So looking at Lee Jae-myung's speech based on some timeline, the key thing that he talked about was the redemption of real estate development profit. And as for uh, the candidate Lee na -kyun, he mostly talked about eradicating corruption. So in other words, uh, real estate issues are a topic of hot debate these days. And we compare the speeches of these two presidential candidates to see what they focus on with regards to these real estate issues. And if we combine speakers and issue, we can assess the speaker's power of influence on the issue. So in other words, by looking at uh, what percentage or what sh how, much, how much share they have in certain issues, we can tell who is the quote unquote issue maker. And we looked at four topics, real estate, basic income, vaccine, and disaster relief fund. And this data was collected from, oh, this data is based on the data collected from January 1st to June 26, 2021. And with regards to uh, the real estate, uh, Lee Jae-myung occupied 10% of the share, followed by Hong Nam-gi and Moon jae -in. And for basic income, Lee Jae-myung had 48% of the share. So in other words, during this given period, the person who led the real estate issue or the issue maker of real estate was Moon Jae-in, followed by Hong Nam-gi and Lee Jae-myung. And as for the basic income, Lee Jae-myung is the one who had the biggest share and therefore is the one who's a issue maker in terms of the basic income. And next is the related keyword for the speaker. So if we combine the speaker plus the keyword, we will be able to find out to what the speaker's items of interest are. And we call them related keywords. So from December 8th of 2020 to December 14th of 2020, we looked at uh, the related keywords for Lee Jae-myung, and those were Governor of Gyeonggi Province and Disaster Relief Fund. And the picture below was, is a chart that was introduced, that big board chart, and it shows the related keywords for Seoul Mayor Oh Se-hoon, and they were single candidacy, An su candidates, and uh, People's Power Party. So in other words, 
single candidacy and Chersu presence for candidates and people power party are the four items of interest for Ose Hum. Next is about the issue flow. If we combine time and issue together, you'll be able to see what the issue's flow is. In other words, we can find out, based on this issue flow, what the life cycle of this issue is. The chart on the top right is about the allegation that the prosecution, prosecution instigated the opposition party to file criminal complaints. And the graph at the bottom is about the Daejangdong scandal. So at the top, it's based on data from July 21st to October 20th. And uh, we saw how this issue of Kobar Sarju, or like I said before, the allegation on the prosecution changes day by day. And it hit the peak uh, in the second week of September. And then it disappeared it suddenly. As you can see, the graph suddenly declines steeply. And there are many reasons for that. And with regards to the Daejangdong scandal, the, it, that scandal also hit its peak on the second week of September. So in other words, the issue regarding the prosecution was actually covered by uh, the attention that the Daejangdong scandal received. Um, so to explain more, around the end of uh, August, the issue of Daejangdong was first mentioned in social media, and it spread to uh, online communities in September 10th. And around September 14th, the second channel movement uh, occurred uh, when it was reported on the media. So it shows us that Daejangdong scandal started from social media and went through community, and then finally reached the media to reach its peak. So although we need, need to do more research on this, on this, um, the issue of Daejangdong's power of influence has surged greatly in the recent days. And now, if we co if we combine the amount of speech plus the amount of articles that deal with the speech, we can figure out what kind of impact or how much impact the speech has. So the speech of a certain speaker would be reflected in newspaper articles. And we believe that the amount of articles relative to the amount of speech actually indicates the impact that the speech has. If you look at the graph on the top right, the x-axis shows the amount of speech, and the y-axis shows the amount of articles. And the person at the top right is the one who has many amount of articles relative to the amount of speech. And the person on the bottom left has a small amount of articles relative to the amount of speech. The one who has uh, the great greatest uh, amount of articles relative to the amount of speech is Lee Jae-myung, followed by Yoon Seo-gyeol, Lee Na-kyung, Choi Jae-yeong, Hoon Jung-kyo, Won Il-yong, An Chul-soo, and Yoo Seung-min. So we don't know what correlation this has uh, on with regards to the public preference of these candidates. Uh, but this data, this graph is based on data from October 18th to 24th. And we we're able to see that the person who has the greatest speech impact is Lee Jae-myung, followed by Yoon Seo-gyeol. And the dotted line that is on, uh, go, that goes across the chart shows us that the top left half uh, space shows that there is a great amount of articles, whereas the top uh, bottom right space shows that there is a smaller number of articles. And therefore, we can say that the speech impact of Yoon seok yeol is greater than that of Lee na -kyun. And the graph on the bottom right shows a graph based on data from July 23rd to August 5th and it shows a speech impact of the candidate, Yoon seok yeol So the blue stick shows the amount of articles, and the orange stick shows the amount of speech. And we could see that compared to other candidates, the amount of articles that he, uh, covered the speech of Yoon seok yeol was greater than other candidates relative to the amount of speech that he made. 
and especially uh, the remarks that he made around the time in July were uh, the focus of the media articles. And now let's look at the speech influence. If a speech of a certain individual is quoted in the media, that would indicate the person's the influence that the speech has. So in other words, the number of times a speech was quoted in the media indicates the speech's influence. And for about a week uh, from April 30th to May 7th, uh, we created a ranking, which is called the Weekly People Ranking, in which um, ranks uh, people whose speech was quoted the most number of times in the media. And the first person who was on the top of the list is President Moon Jae-in. And at the bottom right, uh, this actually shows uh, what speech made by this certain individual made the most number of articles. And it's a comment made by lawmaker Cho Soo-jin. And the speech that she made on a certain day uh, led to the publishment of 90 articles uh, showing the greatest amount of exposure. So we can say that this certain speech made by lawmaker Cho Soo Jin had the greatest amount of influence on that certain day. And the person who had the greatest speech influence is when we look at uh, other people. Uh, it is Kim Yo-jung of North Korea. You know, it's her statement that she will blow up South Korea. And around 1,000 articles were written quoting that remark. So to date, um, this remark has the greatest speech impact and speech influence in a single day. And when the speech is quoted, in the media, we can compare how the story based on the speech is written between different media outlets. So in other words, we can see how the media, different media writes the story differently while quoting the speech. So on September 28th, 2020th, uh, during the high-ranking official meeting, the President Moon Jae-in made a remark, and many media quoted the remark that he made in that meeting. But one media outlet quoted his speech in a different way. So the Joseon Ilbo article title was this, President Moon provides his condol condolences just a week after person A goes missing and there is no rebuke towards North Korea. So this was quite different from the speech, uh, the exact remark that was made by President Moon Jae-in. And afterwards, the title of this article was revised. And next, uh, we can compare the keywords of the issue that are a present in the media and social media. And by comparing keywords extracted from media articles and those from social media, we can make comparison between the voice of the media and the voice of the public and what they deem as important. So the media keywords and social media keywords were highly similar, although they do differ in terms of their rank. So, but there were some differences in the keywords as well. So if you look at the news keywords, ranked at the fourth is COVID-19. But if you look at the social media keyword and online community keyword, um, it does not rank on the fourth of the list. So this may show that the general public is becoming tired of reading and hearing about COVID-19. And you know, ranked at the fifth in the news keyword is uh, People's Power Party, but in social media and community, People's Power Party ranked 13th and 19th, respectively. 
So the news media, the media outlet actually considers the keyword People Power Party as very important, but that's not so the case in social media and community. And as for Democratic Party, uh, they ranked fourth in both social media and community. And as you know, this is right before, be right after the elections, and the Democratic Party was caught up in some controversies. However, in the news keyword, it was not even ranked in the top 20. The keyword Democratic Party was not ranked in top 20 at all. So the keywords of the news and keywords of the general public do have their differences in terms of their rank. And another important keyword is Nuriho vessel, which ranked ninth in social media and also ninth in community, but it did not rank in top 20 in the news. So the speeches and the speaker data that are in the news allows us to gain a new perspective of the world. And based on these data, we are currently pursuing a project, and I would like to tell you about that. So if we want to know about a certain person, what do we do? We usually go to online porters or uh, people dictionary and search for that person. In porters, portals, you can see their date of birth, their affiliation, their position and career. And you, know, you can basically see a lot of resources and data material about that person. And in dictionaries as well, in Wikipedia, for example, you can see a text-based information However, those do not provide us an idea about the people's, that certain individuals' thoughts, ideology, likings, people and places of their interest, related events, and their areas of interest. A person's speech is a reflection of that person's thought. So during the August 15th congratulatory speech, you know, we often uh, made by Moon Jae-in, President Moon Jae-in, um, we sometimes hear the words, keywords like Japan or North Korea being mentioned, and depending on the amount of the word Japan and North Korea being mentioned, we can see um, that uh, President Moon Jae-in really has interest in those two areas. And so the words that that are usually expressed the speeches really contain that person's thought and the people and places and events and areas that the, a person mentions often is an item of his or her interest. During the past 10 years, uh, we took four, 47 million data from 54 media outlets and we, based on that data, we try to find out who the people of interest is for candidate Lee Jae-myung. So in other words, we looked at the names of these people that Lee Jae-myung frequently mentioned based on newspaper articles that were published. So as you can see, Lee Jae-myung mentioned people like Park Geun-hye, Moon Jae-in, and Noh Moo-hyun. And people who were mentioned together with Lee Jae-myung were Moon Jae-in, Lee Na-kyung, and An Chol su We did the same thing for location or geography. So the location of Lee Jae-myung's interest was Gyeonggi-do, Gyeonggi province, the Seongnam city, and the Republic of Korea. And locations that were usually mentioned together with Lee Jae-myung in newspaper articles was uh, not the Korean Peninsula, but Gyeonggi Province, the Seoul City, and Seongnam City, and also uh, Gwangju, and so on. Then, and we can also analyze who Lee Jae-myung is, what kind of person he is based on his speech. And we can see um, you know, the events that he is associated with, his affiliate organizations, his affiliated locations, and so on. So if you get this data, the related people for Lee Jae-myung is Moon Jae, Lee na and An Chol su related locations is Gyeonggi Province, Seoul City, and Seongnam City, and related organization is Democratic Party, Government, and National Assembly. So, and also, we can see 
his thoughts about certain events based on these data as well. For example, what he thinks about the April 15th uh, event and so on. And I would like to also tell you that by analyzing these data, we can uh, analyze the competitive power of each presidential candidate. Uh, so we have seen Won Ilyong through the impact of speech and compared him to Che Jae-hyung and Yoon suk yeol In other words, we saw how many articles are being published uh, with regards to Won Hee-ryong's uh, remarks. Uh, and uh, you can see that the number of articles that is being churned out for Won Hee-ryong has been increasing since uh, July 20th when he said he's going to run for the pres run for presidency. And by looking at the share uh, that an individual has about a certain remark, we can also see the impact of his or her speech. And now let's take a look at a map that shows the location of Won Hee-ryong's speech impact, which allows us to compare his speech impact with that of other candidates. So I explained this earlier, but at the top left is the place where the speech impact will be great. So in other words, compared to other candidates, the amount of articles is high relative to the amount of speech. So and on the bottom right in the blue square, it shows that compared to the other candidates, both the amount of articles is low relative to the amount of speech. So we can make people dictionary and also conduct a competitive analysis uh, based on the data that we collect. Uh, and the data that were released in so as I said before, these data are extracted from news. And once the data is extracted and organized, they are again broadcasted in news programs. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chu Jae-sun, for your interesting presentation. So the presidential election will be held next year. And I think based on your presentation, we can really take a look at how the media is portraying the candidates and what kind of remarks were made by the candidates. So it was indeed an interesting presentation. Now allow me to introduce the next speaker. And our next speaker is Park In-hye, reporter at the media platform team of Hanguk Ilbo. Ms. Park has been working in the journalism for the last 15 years. She has spent most of her career in the data journalism and the internet-related businesses, and she is kind of a planner in this business. And her topic today is also quite exciting, and would you please start now? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Park In Hye. I'm a planner at the media platform team in Hanguk Ilbo. So, my topic today is the data journalism and interactive planning. Most of you might not be familiar with the job of planner. In other companies, as my understanding goes, data journalism is covered by the journalists and the designers and publishers as well. But in Hanguk Ilbo, we have a job called planner, just like me. So we are able to explain to you what data journalism is doing from the perspective of the planners. This is my team. I'm going to introduce this. We have the team leader. Reporting to the team leader is planner, designer, publisher, and developer. We have eight people all together. You might be interested in knowing what we are doing. As journalists, we are also covering IT business as well. So we are doing IT and content as our business areas. And we do have the planning and designing for .com, and also we have CMS hub system improvement, and also we do the statistics improvement for the headquarters, and that's related to the IT. The other part is about interactive planning and GIF graphic designing are other parts of my business as well. So we are also doing the research on developing contents. When we do the interactive and planning, what is the job description and how long does it take? In the newsroom and also in the media platform team, sometimes they are 
initiating the ideas about the reporting. Sometimes data is sent and the collection of data is also following. Also, we are doing the pre-job before going to the newsroom. And then decision making is done by filtering the content idea. If you are a journalist, you will know that the collection and analysis of data might prove differently than we thought in the beginning. Probably data you get is not big enough to be covered in an article. Or sometimes you might be disappointed by not seeing the insight from these raw data. Only when you believe that there is a value as an article, you decided to carry on. In between you reporters and the raw material, I am there as a planner. I'm doing the pre-job for this journalist. After my job is done to have the collection of the raw, meaningful raw data, you go ahead with your writing. By job description, we have our processes. By period, it will take some time as a planner I am writing one page, taking about three days. Then my job is converted to designers. Designers will take another three days. And this is the process of making draft. The draft is to be reviewed. So altogether, it will take about seven days for the reviewing. And then the job goes to the publishers and web front development people. It will take another three days. Also, depending on the quality you want, sometimes you need to have the developers, or sometimes you don't. If you, you need developers, it will take another two to three days. In an average, from starting to the end, from initiation to the completion, it takes at least two weeks. But at two weeks is actually the minimum. So you have to say that this is taking three weeks. Therefore, when you start a business, you have to think of the collaboration with the newsroom. And also you have to think of how you can meet the deadline. So this is the list of the interactive cases that I can show you. So we are working with newsroom, as I said, or oh, sometimes we can be standalone as well. So we have the planning reporting team and multimedia team and the social affairs team. So they are all working with us, the media platform team. So I told you that normally it takes two to three weeks to complete the whole article. Sometimes, therefore, if it is necessary to finish the article within a much shorter time, we cannot collaborate. What we are normally collaborating is the type of articles that are investigative and also very meaningful and historical. So they are subject to the collaboration. So these are the very good examples. We had the results of the investigation and the supervision on the elementary school and also the preschools. We had the results that was covered that were covered by our article. There was very good response and also we had the hearing of the appointment of the people, including the minister of the uh, government. And also we had the connection to the platform. The results were seen online in real time. I was very proud to say that we were able to do that. Also, we have the cabinet making process so that people can just take a look at what is really going on in the government. So without bias, they're able to see and observe what the government is doing. Also, we had a new do documentary or the news program that is about the supervisors above your heads. That's about the satellite issues that you are underneath. So that was very informative. And also, it took the longest time, like in two months. But the opening time was almost like the starting time of the COVID-19. So it kind of lost attention from the people. So I am very sorry for that job, although I took a lot of time there. Many of the media companies are doing the collaboration of their own sort. So the way I am working with the me news media room can be relevant to your side as well. So that's how we start from now on. So we confirm and receive the plans for the article. So there was one or two page draft of the planning. So that talks about the content and the purpose of the news program. And then based on that, we are having the meeting with the reporters. 
What we are checking at that moment is to see the findings of the reporters about the case and also how long will it take or how much will be covered will be discussed. And then we schedule them together. Based on the meeting results, we also think of ideas about how we can realize visually so we can use the reference searches and we do the picking of the searches. The reporters go ahead to do their coverage and we are also doing our job on a parallel basis. While the journalists are writing their stories, sometimes they provide us directly or sometimes you know, he is putting his article on the CMS and we are just you know, doing the editing in the meantime. So we just do, do the editing together on the go. So these are the actually preliminary job about writing an article. So we do have the drawing. Axio is the device that I'm using for drawing. So Axio is quite a good for me because it is very useful for the planning and the writing up without having the full text. So the reporters do not have to explain in detail about the article, but be able to show me what he is trying to achieve. And also sometimes we wanted to know what would be the end results. Using Axio, you're able to see the rough ideas about the end result so that it's very useful and helpful for you. So it has that advantage. So on the screen, you can also have the communications about which part needs more elaboration, which part should be changed, and so on. Therefore, the further questions can be made, and also further requests and also can be delivered. Then we are just doing together about the designing and the layout. So that's the end of the planner's job, actually. And after having the product, Every time the product is out, we have the review and correction until the end of the day. Now, once the article is open, that's not the end of the story. We have to have the advertisement, so interactive contents that cannot be put on the porter. We have to play our trumpet, otherwise nobody will just look at us. Therefore, we have to do the outreach to the SNS and also in the dot com, we have to carry the banners as well. That's the promotion activities. That promotion should be done for at least about one or two weeks. So in the meantime, we can also see some errors and change them and correct them if needed. So that will be the wrap up time. Depending on the nature of the job of the planners, we do need a lot of communications with the journalists. We have to have direct communications with the reporters, and sometimes we find it necessary for us to have a daily conversation. It might sound cumbersome, but sometimes it can be also emotional when the time gets tougher. So through my experience, even though it is very difficult to have a very frank communications, it is necessary to have the very frank and open communications in order to have the good end result. And that's what my experience tells me. Therefore, I put the emphasis on the communications, especially communications with the journalists. Now, in order for the data journalism and interactive to shine, I have my own questions to myself. Number one question is about the merit. Do I have the merit when it is based on the digital? So is it necessary for us to explain it in writing, or is it better to use the digital? Second question of mine is, what would the users need to know? What would need the readers would want to know? So for the case of the articles about the torture room in Namyeongdong and the room cells and the for the very poor people, the readers will be very much interested in knowing what the articles are saying because we have to keep in line with the level of interest of the readers. If the digital is really a decorative and decorative only, 
we don't have to spend that much time. So our digital should be serving the needs of the readers. And also the third one is that you know, we have to have the synergy. So without thinking of this you know, the article, we have to have the synergy. And also last question is about the effect on the mobile. So you know, in the, on the mobile, you know, that thing should be over emphasized or you know, less emphasized. So we have to have a trimming down. So it should be, it should be very fit for mobile. Doesn't have to be too much or too less. So far, I've been giving you the planning process so far. Now I'm going to give you some tip to make it more useful. There's, this is another case of having the article of the putting out the list of the preschools that are not so much safe to the children. And the release of the list was made. So we were trying to realize that this information can be given to the general public so that they can be referenced to. That was actually scoop by NBC. And I looked at the scoop article, and there was not a detailed list of it. They just put up the whole file. In itself, was, it was OK. I find I found it useful. I imagined myself as a mother of a preschooler. If I were a mother of a preschooler, the whole file will not be so much helpful to me or convenient to me than knowing if my preschools in my neighborhood can be the subject of this criticism and so on. So. I really wanted to make it in the form of search. So I changed the form based on the file. If you are working for the government, you would know that all the files and the documents are following the different forms. So making in one form or following one form would be almost impossible, as you know. So I worked with, with my team members for days and nights, for several days and nights. So I was almost finished it. And after completing it and also putting it on the porter, that was a bomb because everybody was interested. All the moms were so much excited. And also, they had all the moms' cafes on the internet were just you know, exploding. So it was a very memorable thing that I can remember as the good result. Also, that year, we also had a very big hit of the article here. That's about the small living cells for the very poor people. We were reporting about the structures and neighborhoods and how they live inside these small cells. When we were planning our articles, instead of just de explaining details about how they live, we wanted to have a very clear image of how they are living. So we thought that the several pictures of their livelihood inside the cell building would be very good. So in the beginning, the reporter was doing the interview with the people, and he was taking some pictures. But those pictures were not so much lively to my eyes. Therefore, we wanted to have this 360 degrees of shooting during the interview. So I myself actually have been dispatch it to the place for interview. Sometimes I find it very necessary for the planners to be on the site as well. If I were just you know, stay, staying, staying put in the office to do the, the job here, I wouldn't uh, do the better job. However, I was actually following our journalists to have the interview there. So I was familiar with their layout and structures. So. I decided to use the 360 degrees, and I, I tried to make it more lively. This got very good reaction. Also, it had the high ranking and the popularity of the articles. So, the, so it had also have social impact as well. This is the torture room story in Namyeongdong area. So we have the interactive service here. And also, starting from the art news article, we actually changed the direction of the article. So we decided to make it like a script for a movie or documentary rather than a news article. So because of the time constraint, now we're just you know, skipping this. This is a very recent one. That's about the 
physically interactive that has been in the procedures of the criminal court. So one person get, got into the whole process to experience the procedure of the criminal procedures. That was an explaining of the importance of the procedures and also the very complicated relationship between the prosecutors and the police. And also, the, if it is interactive, we can also see how long it can take and how much complexity it can have. So as you see here, we have a very complicated tree structures. All the things are being repeated. And also, we have the request for the investigation. We have also request for the protection. So these are actually repeating themselves, therefore, in every step they require also the questions and answers. We also had to think of all the possible scenarios out of the whole steps. And also, in order to make it the digital, we should not make any cell left behind or empty. Therefore, each cell took so much time for us to fill. Also, this is a service based on the experience of people when they are expanding the screen it should move very naturally. Also, when it is closing down or getting smaller, vice versa. And also, Minister of the Justice also made promotion of this, saying that they're going to use this. And also, because of his, of his comment, we got more popularity. So it was very meaningful. I'm still remembering that. This is another story. The title is The Public Servant Fallen into the Farmland. With the title, and we also have a very instant visualization. The story says the reason why the public servants were using the land to have their investment. So the farmland was misused by these public servants. Instead of telling the story, we wanted to show how much land has been misappropriated by these public servants, public officials. Also, we need to have a lot of data in, at the back end. And then we purify this data to show the end result very clearly. So we were just moving into the end result very smoothly. These are the list of my cases that I can show you. So this is summary. The interactive design of Korea, and also as well as in Hangul Gilbo, has been developed very much until today. So we have some articles that cannot show the whole pie of the picture, but we are using the digital to show the actual graph of that. So we have been making our advancement bit by bit until we reach this story. And we are also trying to create a new type of story. So this is the evolution path we have made so far. And I'm proud to say that we have developed into this. So this is a very short period of time to make the interactive. Actually, it started May 2018. Up to October 2021, we have 17 interactive released for the last three years. Maybe 17 is not a big number, and maybe three years is not a long time. But we were also encouraged by having the awards on many occasions like this. This is a list of the awards we received. So we feel that we have full support by the external people as well. So internally, we have the higher ranking in the attention of the people. And also externally, we were just cited by other people telling us that it is a good job. Last but not least, as a planner, when I have the face up with the journalism, I have some tips for you. So we have to have, number one, a variation, not just copying the article. So digital is something that you can add up on top of the article itself, that you can make it more brilliant than the original story. So that's the joint job with you and the journalist. Second, you have to make the experience of the data and story. So if you have the full experience of the data and story, you can have the better result. So you can maximize the effect. Third tip of mine is to have suggestions as much as possible, as many as possible. And also you have to try various types of the things. You are the owner of the project. You are the one who can initiate these suggestions. So you have to do it as much as possible. Last but not least, my suggestion to you is that small 
success will make the attention from other people different. So if you are successful in smaller steps, maybe they are going to look at you differently. So I encourage many people who are trying to do the digital or who are initiating digital now, you have to move on and do the same thing over and over until you get recognized. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Park. Hanguk Ilbo has been well known for its design and on different formations for the articles. And she has been giving us the details about how they are collaborating between the planners and the journalists. For those of the audience watching YouTube, please write your questions on the chat box so that we can just get the answers for you later. So please do not hesitate to make questions. The next presenter is Ms. Kim Yoon-jin, digital reporter at Kyongyang Shimun Data Journalism Team. The title of the presentation is a review of five years experimenting interactive news. So in the news digital area, she has done interactive reporting, production, and creation. Hello. As introduced, my name is Kim Yoon Jin. So I think my presentation is rather long, and I'm worried that I won't be able to cover all of them. I will, I will try to be as speedy as I can. So to introduce myself briefly, so it's only been four to five years since I've been working at the media, so I'm at a junior level. So from the very time when I was employed by my employers, I was employed as the dedicated IT personnel. And recently, we created a new team called Data Journalism Team, and I am now part of that team to work on data journalism. So this is a data journalism conference, but you might wonder why I'm talking about interactive news. So I prepared this to answer the question that you might have. So the space that best shows data analysis outcome is the web space or interactive news. So that's why I, pre I prepared this example. So this is a uh, article that we published recently based on data given by Seoul Metro. And so we measured the platform gap at metro stations. And we found out that there are many stations uh, whose platform gap is greater than it should. Uh, nevertheless, no supplementary measures have been taken. And so the platform gap in metro stations in Seoul cannot be shown in a single article, but in an interactive news format, uh, people can actually take a look at all of them in a visual way. So rather than writing this into a online article, interactive news is the best way to deliver this piece of information to our readers. As you can see, if you select the Songshin Yode station, the average platform gap is as large as 20 centimeters. And in those stations, uh, we saw a lot of accidents occurring. And you can see all this in the interactive report. Then interactive news or data journalism are new concepts. And why do we need to explore them? And I thought of some reasons. And I believe the most important thing is number three, the uniqueness or differentiation. Uh, the media outlets are facing risks in terms of their profit model. And you know we are in an era where we're talking about AI journalism. So therefore, we need to be able to provide a solution that provides quality journalism. And I believe that data journalism and interactive news is necessary to that end. And whether you know they're Washington Post or the New York Times overseas. And in providing membership and paid subscription, these uh, data journalism and interactive news can really uh, attract people to sign up for paid subscription. 
So the team that is in charge of interactive news and data journalism has changed. In 2013, we began under the name of interactive team. And at the time, you know, just using social media was new back then. So our team was uh, responsible for social media news. But as you know, like the key platforms were used to be Facebook, but now it's YouTube, uh, Instagram, and TikTok. So major platforms always change. And so the contents that are created by the team and many other teams uh, were different depending on what platform is in trend these days. But what has not changed over the years is interactive news. And we have engaged in interactive news for eight years and released about 100 releases. And we have about one to three people in the team uh, whose average production period is about two weeks. You might think that this is a small number of people, but we have uh, IT people plus the reporters. And I'm the IT person, as a matter of fact. And as I said before, the average production period is about two weeks. And just like Hangul Gilbo, we would do on the scene coverages, or sometimes uh, we would look at some data and collaborate with other entities to create these articles. And in the process of making interactive news, we do have a guideline, and I attach some of the guideline here. So in each stage, this guideline specifies what the IT person and what the reporter needs to do. But as a matter of fact, uh, both the IT people and the reporters are involved in every step, and they perform certain tasks in their tests. And to be frank, the roles and responsibilities of each member is not clearly divided yet or set in stone because we uh, and so we are more flexible um, so you know if we are to just abide strictly by the guideline it takes too much time so sometimes in, in producing interactive news you need to be flexible so the new contents team and data journalism team usually produce interactive news that look like the examples that I'm going to show right now so Usually, we combine scroll and animation layout in our interactive news. Scroll is, you know, basically a, a layout uh, that fall, uh, goes from the top to bottom by scrolling the mouse or by, you know, scrolling the page of mobile devices. And we add animation layout here. So as you can see on the screen, uh, this interactive news is about the Rohingya uh, refugees. So based on a report that we secured, we made some visualizations on the web like this. And as for this one, so thankfully, last year, we won an award at the Data Journalism Award. And it is called There Was Kim Yong-kyun Every Way. And it talks about the deaths that occur from industrial accidents every year in Korea. So we archived uh, the cases. And so the interactive news was not just a news, but also an archive. And it's not just an archive as well. There are calendars and charts that visualize many statistical figures. And as for this article, uh, the film Parasite was receiving a lot of attention overseas. And here in Korea, we wondered how many people actually live in these low uh, areas uh, that were portrayed in the film. So we uh, obtained the data of all the people who live in the semi-basement Homes. But if we were to just, just use that data on a text report, then we'd just only be giving figures. So we wanted to give some graphics. And this was time when local elections were held. So we wanted people to be able to see how many people in their own local region live in semi-basement. 
So through this interactive news, uh, people were able to search their neighborhood and see how many people live in semi-basements. And on the top right, uh, it, it shows you how many people live in local governments across the nation, among them what percentage lives in semi-basement houses. And on the at the bottom, it focuses on the Seoul metropolitan areas. And we saw the data that has high correlation with different districts. Uh, so this is a visualization of that as well. So there is a piece called Witnesses of Climate Change, which was made last year. And actually, this news was published on the news in text form five times. But we thought that we could do more because this piece of information is so valuable that we took some of the articles that were published and extracted what's important from it and visualized the contents to make this interactive news. So when the text articles were written, it did not receive a lot of attention. But when we rewrote these articles in the form of interactive news, it was circulated broadly. And one broadcasting company mentioned how well created this is. So you might think, you know, be surprised that, you know, some contents that we've used already can again receive attention if we produce produce them in different formats. And next, it is during when the number N room scandal occurred. So it's, talk, it's about sexual crime that happens across digital space. And there should be a chronicle or a history of such sexual crimes that have happened in online spaces. So that was a topic of this interactive news. And the structure of this is very unique because on just like Tare function in Twitter, so we, if you click on a certain timeline, it highlights not only that event, but also other events that are related to that. And it shows um, how the court proceeding is in present state. And so that was a very unique factor of this interactive news, and it also received a lot of attention. So, so far, I have shown uh, some simple interactive news like, you know, scrolls and animation based on which users can interact with the news. But we also provide game format news. It's web browser based. And if I were to share some of the responses for these game news, is that we're not doing this anymore because uh, the output is not so insufficient uh, compared to the amount of effort that goes into this game-based news. So based on this experience of Failure. We were able to find out that users don't want to use their time unless it's something really fun or something that is meaningful or constructive to them. But the source codes and algorithms uh, that we use to realize these gains can be reused a lot of times. So we thought that although we failed, we can always reuse the source codes and algorithms, and they can become a good asset for us. So we had this positive mindset. So as you can see, this is a case of a foreign media outlet. Uh, Steer through the Suez Canal is a title of this newspaper article. And it shows how or it allows the users to simulate how difficult it is for a vessel to go through the Suez Canal. And also on the bottom right, it's a simulation uh, based on AI as to how you can navigate with a particle. And that's what we wanted to do, you know, using 3D to allow uh, the interaction with the users, but that was not what we were able to do. We, this is what we did. It's not 3D, it's more close to 2D. 
So, to provide a high level quality content, as you've seen in the earlier example, all the uh, contents need to be created, and you need to be able to use these uh, tools like 3JS to realize the graphic, but it's fairly difficult. So, we do face limitations. However, as I said earlier, we can reuse the codes that we used for game news. As you can see on the screen on the left, it's something that we did in 2018, right after the college entrance exam, to organize a history of education in Korean schools. And people can basically answer these questions that are given. And and uh, it shows then um, what generation they belong to in terms of the school history. But this did not receive a lot of attention from the public. But we reused the code. And the year after, to for the March 1st independence movement, we had this interactive news called, what kind of person do you think you were before the March 1st movement? And it was creating a short period of time, maybe about a week or so. Nevertheless, this interactive news was a great hit. It reaped a lot of success. And these are the codes that were recycled. And we're no longer called a new contents team. In July, data journalism team was newly created. And the interactive news is now under the responsibility of this new team. But it is still in its pilot stage, and it is comprised of three people, a reporter, digital journalist, myself, and an intern. And we would produce a story, make that into an online article, and also create that in the form of interactive news. So it's in an OSM format. That's the goal. That's the general goal that we have. So our are, we are also under the name Dive today. So this data journalism team called Dive has so far published two to three articles. First is an award-winning piece which sees the network of scholars who took part in the Moon Jae-in administration. And through crawling, we, based on the native Naver Academy data, figured out how these uh, scholars are related to each other and what their network might be. And so we calculated the values, and we separate them into nodes and links. And through VJS library, we were able to visualize this piece of information. So at the top, it's what's shown on the web. And at the bottom right is the picture that appeared in the text article. But as I said earlier, in papers, it's not so easy to figure out or comprehend what this picture actually represents. But online, the user can click each individual, and through tooltip, the information is provided for each individual. So when we look at the highlighting function and other things, you know, interactive news is a far more effective way of delivering these types of information. And this is the article about the, or the news about the platform gap that I talked about earlier. So we did have this on paper as well. So after interactive news is published, uh, we conduct reviews. And it's, our conclusion is that it is difficult to create an interactive news that you know would receive a satisfactory level in all the standards of a good interactive news. And if we looked at our achievements, um, as I said before, we have created interactive news for the past five 
about eight years. So we were able to establish some awareness uh, in the industry. And uh, there has been some outsourcing done as well in collaboration with external organizations and companies. And therefore, we were able to generate profit. And uh, this also heightened awareness for the need for digital contacts within the editing bureau. And through many trials and errors, we were able to gain a lot of experiences, modulized sources and templates and so on. And while dealing with more uh, than 100 interactive news, we also gained other understandings. And one is be simple. So in the past, interactive news itself was just so new, hovering with the mouse, you know, clicking something and popping something out was very new to the readers. But today, that's not so new anymore. And in the past, the contents were consumed mainly through personal computers, but these days it's mobile devices, and therefore users do not prefer uh, an interactive page with complex structure anymore. And you can, we cannot make, we should not make an interactive news that looks like a digital pamphlet. So because we were obsessed about breaking away from paper format, uh, we did a lot of things, but the more we did, they looked like digital pamphlets, and they would not have substances, there would be no hierarchy among the text, and there would be no context. So this type of format should be avoided as much as possible. So if you look at some common points of interactive news that were well received, is that there should be an intro for immersion. So once the readers come across the content, it should not be uh, the story that they come across first, but there should be some kind of an intro that would attract them. And we would provide, uh, we would have to provide minimum interaction with maximum effect. And the structure has to be simple, and we need to have a good thematic consciousness. But if I were to also tell you some limitations that we face, uh, interactive news cannot be provided via portal through e-link. So, therefore, we would have to circulate interactive news through buzzword or voluntary sharing and so on. So these are some of the things that we made. And yes, some of them were popular and some of them had a lot of pra uh, traffic. But our goal, you know, loyal uh, readers and um, quality journalism, were those two satisfied? That still remains as a question. And another limitation is, is it possible to generate profit for interactive news? As I said earlier, we don't have a clear profit model. And for readers, it's still uh, new for them to pay money to actually consume uh, these articles. Uh, so that's some of the limitations as well. So let me just tell you about some libraries and visualization tool that can be used in interactive news. Actually, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to skim through them. And you may refer to my presentation later to see them. So it's unfortunate that I wasn't able to cover everything that I've prepared. But you know, interactive news and data journalism is pursued by many people who are listening to this presentation, I'm sure. And I hope that my presentation was helpful. Thank you, Ms. Kim Yujin, for your presentation. So questions are being raised through YouTube chat. And we have one more speaker to go, so we will address those questions later. Our next speaker is Ms. Anhe Min from SBS. She's working as journalist at the Data Journalism team, and she's going to give us the newsletter from the Data Journalism team. I, myself, am a subscriber for the Mabu newsletter from SBS data journalism team, so I'm very interested in knowing. So it's he. Thank you very much. My name is Annie Hemin. I'm working for the data journalism team in SBS. Before I start my presentation, I'm going to give my own introduction. Mabu's team 
was actually starting from the end of 2015 and the articles were started to be written from 2016. I myself have joined in 2016 as an intern, so I was working in the internet team and then I became a full member as a regular employee in 2017. It has been roughly about six years since I am involved in the data journalism. I am experiencing the environment data journalism every day since then on. And also, we do have our concerns about why we're not so much popular as we expected, even though we made a tremendous amount of time and effort. So as a response to that, I'd like to talk about our newsletter activities and our trials and errors. I'm going to start by showing you the three letters, newsletters. So the Mabuza team as actually have the Mabuza newsletter. The second one is made by the surprise team, and data team is also running the cow.letter. The third letter is data journalism letter by economist. As our understanding goes, the newsletters related to data journalism are all about these things. Among them, we are the first comer, actually, because we were first planning this in 2015, and then we started to issue the newsletter from 2016. We had two rounds of reorganizations, but our framework has been maintained so far in a Roughly. Each of the page can be explained to you one by one so that we can understand what intention was there. And this is the first phase. So we also had our message that we are following you from the Mabu Tak team. It was kind of event. And this one off event started as our teaser. In order to issue a newsletter, we know that why people are not watching us or looking at us much, even though we were awarded by many organizations. And also our concern is that why are we not remembered by the people? In 2018, the Munich was started, and it was November 10th, and then the US so newsletter was actually promoted that much. So we wanted to just have our follow-up of our readers, so that is how we started our planning. So that was the program to just go to our readers. I think it was the end of 2019, Reuters Journalism Institute issued a report, and their concern was about the method of young people to consume the news programs, and also what action and reaction have been made by the young people after reading them. What I was interested in was actually two. Number one, young people are accepting the news as the growth and the interest. To the prior generations, news is something do you have to have, you are compelled to be con in contact with. But young people thought differently because they thought it would, as long as I re read the news, the news should be helpful to me. Therefore, they are very much concerned about the efficacy and the benefit of reading the news. So the institute issued a report about this. So with that, I was also holding a lot of workshops in order to have the better understanding about the news. And the next one is, we, the left one, we have a cartoon that is almost coming from the US newspapers in the past. We have the new ideas, but design was old style cartoons, so we will need to have the mixture of these two things. So in our own way, we also had our ecology made, and also we wanted to have the interactions with the readers in this format. This is the final format we decided upon before launching. The first newsletter issue was launched in February. In the earlier days, we had two tracks. Every Thursday, we have the main newsletter, and every Tuesday, we had the sub booklet of the newsletter, extra letter. The main letter was talking about the timely issues of the social sciences, and also if data was available, we included the data as well in order to see the context and also in order for them to see the context. Now, on the extra letter, we wanted to have some other contents that can be explained better in data form. So this is the junk chart as a menu as represented by the cat here. 
in this corner of junk chart, we want it to indicate wrong data and also the problematic data and the issues that we have to think about when we want to data for the articles. So this kind of column type. And also at the bottom, you see a chicken there. Its menu name is the clue. It is kind of quiz service for the subscribers. So we wanted to enhance their consciousness and awareness of the data. The first phase was rather successful. We were recognized by our readers, and our subscription ship has increased dramatically. The problem, however, is that we had to spend so much effort compared to the benefit, because we also had Mabuchi as a separate project. So we were running two projects at a time. We soon found that we were overwhelmed by the size of the two projects, according to the members of our team. We knew that Dimabu was quite popular and being adored by some fans, and we got a lot of feedback. But workload on ourselves was so much, so we decided that we were not able to continue that way. So we had the first round of reorganization. When that reorganization happened, we had a lot of ideas. So we knew that there are so many good articles about the data journalism. We have to introduce these articles to the readers. And also, we can have some kind of curation job of the existing articles. So after the reorganization, this is the new format we followed. In the past, we had only one content at a time, but we are now spreading all different articles according to the journalist. For example, if I remember what has mentioned by the Hangul Bilbo and Kyang Shimun in the earlier speeches, we have to now know what kind of needs are there, the efforts are there to understand. And if we have some consumption of the news like this, it will be good. So this kind of idea of curation, not just for the reference, we also wanted to continue our data journalism, and also we also provided the original news articles as well. You have the three columns here. The second and third column here are actually produced by our team members. We can call them data columns. So the first one is the middle is, is the areas of the development limitation. So this is public areas that were limited in the development. We introduced those areas. At the bottom, in the center, we have the chicken here. That's in the relationship and correlation between the chocolate and the health. Also on the right, we have the more appealing features for the young people. So we came up with the idea of using music. So this column is about using music as an appealing source. At the bottom is about the visualization of data. So this is some insight by the designers in terms of the visualizations. We also had this feature to have the awareness. So starting from that, from August 2020 to August 2021, for one full year, which is the longest time, we had the provision of our services starting from reference to original content. However, unfortunately, we faced with a very difficult barrier here, starting from the reference, because we also have the provisions of these references from other countries as well. New York Times, Washington, the Washington Post also had, another newspapers also had the very good data journalism there. We wanted to introduce those articles from those very prestigious newspapers, but those international newspapers changed their policy to paid subscription, not free views. So if I had the curation of these articles, then we will be criticized. So the referencing was not possible anymore. From then on, we focused our attention more on the original content than reference. That's the how we decided to produce our content as well. Onto the sub stack, if it is a color 
letters here, we use these places to put our articles. So in the sub stack of these, we, we began to have more subscribers onto these walls vertically. After having the paywall, as I said, it was very, it was very difficult for us to have the reference. So this is why we began to have the third page, and this phase three. This is the current shape of Mabu News now. The previous newsletter format was not possible anymore, while the demand by the subscribers was getting higher. The lawyer customers had to be found, and we had to have the fervent and ardent fans of ours. We wanted to know how to make them possible. Then this is the result of our discussions. So we wanted to put more efforts onto the Mabu News. So this is the third version after having the second round of reorganization. So as if we were just having the paid services, we wanted to know which persona is used for which part part of the our assets, and we wanted to be very clear cut in our criteria from the beginning. Our target is to help our readers to have clearer concept about what they have not fully understood from the articles. We wanted to send our newsletters so that we can help them to have a much better image of the things that are reading. So how we're doing. So we started with the theme of the gaps. By theme of the gaps, I mean there is a difference of the susceptibility of the readers. Some people value gender issue the most, while some others believe that these uncomfortable ideas are not their taste. Environmental issue is the same. We also have the dichotomy of the people. Amongst the young people, they value the environmental issues as if their own life. However, the older generations do not have the feeling about the environment as the young people do. Also, education is also another example for having this dichotomy of the feelings. Young school children have the importance of education because they have to go to college. But all the generations may have forgotten the importance of education. So if they have the gaps of the susceptibility, understanding, or feeling, we can fill the gap with the, with the data. Sometimes we can prove that your saying is right and also, you can, we can say that what you believe is true according to this fact. So this kind of encourage, encouragement of the people to continue their beliefs. And this is why we had our newsletter in this form. It's been two or three months since we had the latest reorganization. According to the feedback from our readers, we feel very fortunate and grateful because many of them have seemingly understood our intention. The most memorable feedback is a very simple but short one sentence. It was the discussion point that I wanted to have with my children. End of quote. So with the newsletter, if family is having the discussion with the members inside, that would be the fulfillment of our our wishes. Getting the feedback, we were mo more encouraged to do better in our newsletter job. Technically speaking, at the moment, we are doing things this way. For the main letter, we are using CB to send our newsletters. Also, inside this, we have some kind of illustrative ideas in a very simple form of its image than the original content. However, if you want to have deeper understanding or have the in detail of the article in the sub stack, you can also read the data and see the data there because we have more in-depth data in here. So then you can take the data out if you want to, and also you can have the time to analyze the data here. Without having the newsletter, and if we had written the articles only, we wanted to, we might have wanted to put as much as possible in the newsletter and writing. 
and we might, might have made a very dense article. However, with the presence of newsletter, we know that we can just take the workload off to the newsletter from the main news article. So it's a combination of reading and seeing at the same time, so it can be helpful to the readers. My time is almost up. This is the last page. I believe the most important factor is the readership themselves. So in the past, when I was writing an article, I thought I was putting the importance of the readers. However, only after I started to make a newsletter, I realized that I had to think of our readers more. So the top priority should really be given to the readers. So that's the realization I made after making the newsletter. So this is not good, just not just good for the data journalism, but for the whole journalist journalism itself. So if you are in the journalistic world, you have to think of this kind of use of data for newsletters and others. The last one is the QR code for the Mabu News. So I hope that any of you can have a just notification in here. Please come in and take your footprint here. Thank you very much. It will not take long. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. News organizations and the private companies have had the data generation. The examples have been shared and explained, and also their concerns have been also explained. We had questions on the chat box, and also we have pre-delivered questions as well. This session should be finished by 2040. Out of the questions from the audience, we have a selection of questions only. And then also, I will take turn by asking questions from me as well before we end this session. First of all, so among the viewers, some questions were raised. And one of those questions, or some of those questions, uh, were focusing on uh, uh, the our presenter Park in let me read the question. Compare, comparing the situation when you have the planner or when you do not have the planner, do you have any advantages or disadvantages? Can you explain that? Most of other companies do not have planners, as I understand, but our organization has planners like me by having the communications in between the IT people and the journalists. As you know, the journalists use different languages than those people in the IT department. Their way of working is also different, so the modes of operation are different. Until the end of the final product is finished, their communications, therefore, might not be smooth. Planners like me in between here can do th those jobs. I've been in the journalism for 15 years, and my major was IT, so I have not my knowledge about my job, and I have my own working experience, so I am very proper to have the better communications between the two worlds. As you know, journalists put their emphasis on the essence of their stories or purpose of their stories, then the IT realization or layout Therefore, journalists are not proper to have the good explanation about what they want. I, on behalf of the journalists, explain in their own words and languages to the IT people so that IT people can understand better. So end result, I am sure, is heightened quality and guarantee of understanding, as I think. So the people understanding IT are more and more needed in the organizations of media, right? Yes, I think so. I think this must be a common question by all the journalist world. So the designers or IT people are working for the media. Are there remunerations or working conditions got better so far? So any answer? Commuting, please. Ah, ah, ah. So I'm not sure if I'm in the position to answer this question, but uh, recently we did conduct a hiring process, and one of the biggest challenges is that in terms of developers, they don't really want to come to media outlets. Nevertheless, uh, you know, we made a lot of promotions, and 
thankfully, some developers uh, did apply, and we're in the process of an uh, interview. But whether it comes to data journalism or data or journalism itself, you know, the developers do not develop based on a given storyboard, but they would start from scratch. And if there are some technical difficulties, uh, they would try to, or they would need to try to find out a way to make that work. And that's not how things are done in traditional IT world. And we also need developers who are interested in news, who are interested in content, and at the same time can develop well. So those kind of developers are hard to find. And even if there are those developers that you don't know if they still want to stay at our company, uh, so that's really challenging in terms of finding talents. So a person by the ID, Oksudong Kultanji, was raised the first question, and the person by the name of ID Min Ho Shin raised a second question. So let me then give you a question to the reporters. So as for Mabu News, you said the, the contents would have to be shared among parents and children. And the reader response to the outcome is highly important, but I'm curious to know about the internal reactions, the response of your organization. So to two to three weeks or maybe even, even a week, you might be able to create this kind of news if there is a template, but it takes a lot of effort. and. When things are successful, you receive awards, and I'm sure there are some internal assessment or evaluation done on your teams. And uh, so once you produce and create an outcome, how is its success defined? Is there like a standard or a performance indicator that you have at your organization? So for example, or do you have like a standard? If it, if it managed to generate some profit, then it's deemed as successful. So can you share your organization's case? Uh, Ms. Pagine from Hangul Gilbo? <laughs> Maybe another criteria can be number of hits. The how many is big enough. Well, number of hits varies depending on the time period and the topics. Therefore, they cannot be quantifiable criteria. The biggest hit came from the article about the preschools that have been listed and more than 300,000 hits were made. Also, another article about the torture rooms in Namyeongdong was exceeding the average. So when we talk about all these things, we have to know the average number of hits, and also we have to ha know how much would be in the bigger than the average as well, so how much is you know, successful enough. Also, we have to know those you know, the comments of the relevant people. We can also check the comments from the SNS as well. So by looking at all these you know, comments from the SNS and coming from the comments from the related people, we can decide which one is successful or not. So, so you also said that you know, there was you know, programs like that. So the monetization was also possible is that. You know, but I don't think that the monetization is you know, much you know, frequent. Now, do you have any case to share? So are you so you want me to share the case of monetization. So there are two types. Uh, sometimes we will be able to monetize through the articles that have been published, or sometimes uh, there we will be commissioned by external organizations. So in other words, the other organizations would outsource their work to us, and that would lead to monetization. And you know, I told you about a case about the March 1st uh, special feature. Uh, in which we recycle the past code. And a museum wanted to actually purchase that. And that's when we were able to monetize a project. And other ones are usually uh, based on requests or commissions. So for example, organizations want to deliver the data they have to the public, but they are limited in delivering that. So we would then step up. Uh, and that would lead to monetization. 
So from the news company as a whole, what kind of mission is requested to the data journalism team? So, for example, you need to create 10 products per year, or you need to achieve a certain number of hits. Are there any uh, goals that are set by the organization for your team? So what has been requested uh, of my team is that there is really not, no specific things. So maybe, so we don't have any requests for PVs or profit, but what is requested of us is that. So the Kim Yong-un Kim Yong report was one of the greatest, uh, one of the successful pieces that we created. It did not generate any profit, but it had social repercussions, and many ministries uh, referred to that article, and the law was amended. So. My company wants the team to create some pieces that really adhere to the spirit of journalism, while, of course, profit generalization is important. And yes, monetization does occur, but there is no specific business model. And what's more important is that we need to have a structure of B2C in which the readers or the public are willing to pay for our articles, but in the current ecosystem, that is difficult, and this is not a problem that can be solved by a single media outlet alone. So through data journalism and interactive news, we are able to generate profit, but that cannot be the number one goal. So there are other questions that were raised. And there are questions about interface or accessibility. And I think this could be answered by SBS team. So can you answer this question, which I'm going to read? Young people are familiar with the interactive media. However, the middle-aged subscribers, the, the, the existing ones, might have difficulty of getting the consumption of the digital. So do do you have any considerations to solve the problems or help them to be more familiarized? Do you have anything that you want to change while pursuing your programs about the interactive? Based on my experience, that kind of consideration has to be made anyway, naturally, because when we make the final decision, the the chief editors at the desk are middle-aged people. If they themselves feel it difficult or hard to understand, they are the, really the test of the difficulty. So naturally, we have to consider what can be understood by the middle-aged people, just like my bosses. So we have concentrated on our questions to the media only. So now I'm going to have a question to a private company. So it's for Mr. Chu Jae-sun for, you know, your company provides data based on speech and speakers. And I would like to ask this question to you. So you focused on the speech data of presidential candidates and explained their meaning and significance. And yeah, it's great that the readers are able to understand these data in a more easy way. But when providing this kind of services, what do you pay most attention to or what do you tend to emphasize? So when people speak, their thoughts will be reflected directly in the speech, but and sometimes that would not be the case. Giving Korea's, uh, you know, culture, sometimes people use, um, you know, 
say something that they don't really mean, but it means the other way. And when we look at the speech data, uh, we want to know if that speech is truly aligned with the thought of the speaker or not. That's one of our biggest challenges and concerns, and we have been able to solve this problem to some extent today. So for example, oh, pretty, the word pretty means, that, oh, you're so pretty that I'm going to die. Or some people say, oh, you're so pretty that, that you, you're good for nothing. So these are two expressions to express how pretty the certain individual is. But when we just look at the text itself, the second sentence might not convey how pretty that other person is. So we need to make sure that the text data is delivered without error. And that's one of our biggest challenges. So another question goes to Ms. Park in -hye. Well, we might have had a similar question earlier. This question says as follows. From the perspective of the planner, in your own work, what are the things that you have to consider the most or you have to be careful about most? Probably you need to have some activities to grow the number of planners as well. So do you have anything that you want to have from the company? What makes you happy if the company does something? Are you the only one? My boss is well used to be a planner, but I am the only official planner of the company right now. But we have two people experienced in planning. In my own work, I believe that not just the external activities, but also the internal activities of getting the understanding is quite important because we haven't had enough jobs to have the more consensus about the importance of the planners inside the company. Once the article is finished, it is very important to have the official review amongst all the internal members. And also, we should have more contacts amongst members of the company. However, that's lacking. We haven't had many contacts amongst the people in here. Even in my company, there must be many people who don't know the existence of the job of planning. And they're just journalists, and they do not have the full understanding about what planners are doing from the beginning. So that's why we have to have the training sessions for the members of our own company so that the awareness of the planning is quite heightened. As a planner, I also work with many other people, like journalists and the IT people. But within the IT team, many of them are almost hidden. They are not showing off what they're doing. So even if I try to make understanding of other you know, people from the journalists, the journalists do not have full understanding about what IT people are doing. So as for the journalists, don't you think that journalists are studying on their own about the IT and codes? What do you think about that? When I first joined the company and started as a you know, member of the media, I was a designer, actually. So I was doing the coding. But after becoming a planner, rather than the coding jobs, I thought the planning was actually a fit myself. That, was, that is why I stopped studying coding. But actually, in order to do my job better. We have to have the reference. We have to find the pick of the coding. So that's what I normally do in my own processes. So far, we've been hearing the stories about the internal processings and internal collaboration. So that's my next question. How do you select the theme? What processes it going through? I mean, for example, when you have the dis internal decision making, does it have a just a go to the next step, or do you have to go through another green light from another bus? Because the selection of the theme is quite important, as I think, as well as the timeliness, as you said. Yes, for example, when we do the collaboration, we do have our planning already drafted. So the overall picture has been outlined, so we are on the same page. So we can do the storytelling or the visualization of the story. So that's the thing we have been doing th thus far. However, we wanted to go further. We just should not stop there. Therefore, we wanted to have another content that is being created on the part of the uh, 
data journalism. So we wanted to have a whole new experience for the readers. Luckily, in my organization, I am relatively free from the intervention of the people on, in the upper echelon. So we have our culture in our company that you know, kind of autonomy can be used by me. The only problem I have is the convincing part with the journalist. I really need to have some time taken for the conversation with the journalist so that they can understand better. And then they will not have many misunderstanding about the finer product when they are out after having the um, wrong communications. And the journalists are very much in favor of these conversations that we are doing so well, Ms. Naran, I have another question for you. I know that out there, there are so many people who want to be data journalists. So you know, for the data journalists would be, what do you want to say? You have been in this job for the last three years in SBS. So in your job, do you have any advice to the hopeful data journalists them about the, their preparations or their a notion about the important things. Yes. I sometimes have a chance to have a lecture on the data journalism to the college students. I feel that the number of students who want to be data journalists has been increasing. I say number one advice is that you have to have as many experience as possible. So I know that you want to be a data journalist because you are interested in journalism. So you should have the statistical knowledge and skill as well, as mentioned by many other people. We have to collaborate on many occasions with other people. So the not just the development, but also do you have to have the good understanding about the IT and coding. So if you have at least some experience experience about developing the codes that would be very good. Thank you. This session has been about the data journalism. We have heard the stories from the people working in the field, from the private company and the media. We were also sharing cases of their final product as well. We were also doing a lot of things to make better understanding about what data journalism was about. So we have these four panelists who have been giving us a lot of good cases, and also they have been answering the questions from the audience via YouTube. I really hope that the data journalism can have a better step forward in the future, so I really need your support from the general public. Thank you very much. Thank you, these four panelists. Thank you. Then from now, we will begin session three, data journalism coverage cases. Aside from the lectures, we will also hear from teams that wrote pieces that won the Korea Data Journalism Award. Now we'd like to invite Mr. Oh Seok, General Manager of Digital Innovation Support Group at Korea Press Foundation, as a moderator for this session. Please give him a big hand. Hello, as introduced, my name is Oh Seok. So session three is about data journalism coverage cases. So I did see these coverage cases in advance, and I could really see the amount of hard work that was put into those coverage cases, and this will definitely be a precious session. Uh, the session can be divided into two parts. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Lee Han Beat of Jungbu Ilbo will give us a presentation on four presidential candidates analyzed with big data, and Ms. Choi Yuna from the uh, Han Gyeore will give us a presentation on gender data blank. And afterwards, we'll have a Q&A session. And after that, we will have presentation case presentations of three pieces that award the KDJA awards. And after that, we will also have a Q&A session. So please do leave your questions in the YouTube chat box, and we will address them uh, during the Q&A session. If you do not have any questions, I have to ask them a lot of questions. So please leave your questions there. So let's now hear from Mr. Lee Han Bit of Chungbu Ilbo. Hello. The presentation is titled Four Presidential Candidates Analyzed with Big Data. I would now like to begin my presentation. 
So my presentation can be divided into three parts, the reasons for the production and the process of article production and our accomplishments and ways forward or plans forward. So let me tell you first of all about the reasons for the production. So we have entered the digital age and we have seen a diversification of media. So the legacy media are print and broadcast, but we are also seeing YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and other social social media channels, churning out content and information. This means that the amount of information that we are encountering has become massive. So at Jungbu Ilbo, we not only have print papers, but we have mobile page and web page, and we have social media accounts, and we have YouTube channels. So we make use of various platforms to publish our articles. So the platforms, as I said before, are becoming diversified and the amount of news is increasing. But amid these circumstances, what can we do to deliver objective information to the public? And what we thought about is to use news big data. So based on not the viewpoint of the reporters, but on quantified data such as amount of mentions and related search terms, the news will be analyzed to provide objective information to the public, and this would facilitate the public's understanding of this massive amount of information. So our big data analysis has been done before the four presidential candidate analyze analysis. So during the seventh local elections, uh, we analyzed the media attention on two candidates of the local elections. So we call this election scene through big data. And we advance this to give you our analysis of four presidential candidates with big data. So let me tell you about the process of our article production. So we have five steps uh, in the process. Allow me to introduce them one by one. So first of all, we would choose an item. Then why did we choose the presidential candidates as items of our analysis? And there are three reasons. Well, first of all, presidential election is an important political event that gains attention from everyone in Korea. And some of the strongest candidates uh, are uh, people who are already in the political scene, like Lee Jae-myung, the governor of Gyeonggi province. And because there are so many articles that are turning out in relation to uh, presidential elections, we would be able to raise the accuracy of the analysis. And after selecting the items, we still have some other points to consider. So because this is a political item, we needed an analytic tool from a neutral point of view. So our interpretation and our viewpoint was not incorporated. And instead, the amount of searches regarding the reported articles and the keyword uh, and, and uh, keywords related to certain people were used. But you know, objective facts can be too boring if they're the only things uh, that comprise an article. So we also took into consideration some trends that are shown in online portals and opinion polls and so on. But we would also have to find a way to effectively show the outcome of the analysis and therefore uh, we thought of visualization. So on online articles, we added uh, various images. And in papers, um, we used graphics that would uh, show changes in public sentiment, for example. So for objective analysis, we use big kinds provided by the Korea's Press Foundation. So it has a news content of uh, top five broadcasting companies and 21 Central Press and 28 local daily newspapers, so it's very objective and it has been very helpful to us. So for big data analysis, we would need the information of the four candidates and by inserting their keywords, uh, we would uh, see how many articles were published in relation to these candidates and what kind of articles they were. So if, as you can see, 
uh, at the very top, you can see the number of articles that have been written with regards to these four presidential candidates. And you can see them individually as well. And you can also see the articles by specific time period. And there is something called anal analysis outcome and visualization at the bottom. And we usually use keyword trend and related search term analysis functions. So let me give you an explanation about the keyword trends. So we would identify the changes in the amount of articles that mentions individual candidates depending on different timelines based on the keywords trends. So again, we would see how many articles were written and for what reason and how that continued. So keyword trend was used to that end. So related search terms was also something that we used together with keyword strength function. So based on frequency and weight, the most frequently mentioned keywords would be collected. And based on that, we can check the amount of articles written on certain individuals and issues related to those certain individuals and so on. So those were the objective analysis. And we also tried to understand the trends in public opinion. And we did this in two ways. So many organizations are doing opinion polls and two of them are doing this on a regular basis, Gallup Korea and Real Meter. And therefore, those two have been incorporated into our project. And not only that, we also made use of uh, the portal sites. So through trends analysis in portal sites like Google and Naver, we looked for the search volume and the level of interest in different time periods. To and we incorporate that into our content. So through that process, the article was completed. And this four presidential anal candidates anal anal analyzed with big data was first reported in September 2020. And this was not the time when there were so many presidential candidates. So we had. Um, Yi Dae-myung, the governor of Gyeonggi province, and Yi na the former leader of Democratic Party. So those two were the candidates that we focused on. And we also made use of graphics to try to, but they're not that high quality. And after some time passed in December 2020, we have seen a new candidate coming to the scene uh, from the opposition party, uh, Mr. Yoon so here. And we created grief graphics like this to effectively uh, deliver the information to our readers. So again, we have done our analysis in this three-way race. But in September 2021, Hong Junpyo, member of the People Power Party, began to receive a lot of public attention. And therefore, the big data analysis was on this four-way race. And at the same time, uh, the four presidential candidate analyzed with big data met its first anniversary. And we did a special feature. So we did a comprehensive analysis of big kinds articles over the past year, related search terms, trends and opinion polls, and portal trends. And through this, we analyzed when each contender received attention and what issues affected that attention. Next, I'd like to talk about the accomplishments that we made and our plans going forward. So through the process that I mentioned, every month we've been able to publish four presidential candidates analyzed with big data. And as time passed, the contents became more sophisticated. And we have used various methodologies with regards to our analysis. And therefore, we have received increased attention you know, seen through the number of views and so on. But we did not stop there. We have also done another special feature using big data. And that project is called 
Gyeonggi and Incheon seen through big data, and this is something that we began last month. So the Korea Newspaper Association's iData training session was given to us, and after listening to that, it gave us an idea about new ways of analyzing things, and that is incorporated into this new feature. So, Gyeonggi and Incheon seen through big data is an analysis of data that is closely related to the livelihoods of Gyeonggi and Incheon residents. And as the first part of the feature, uh, we dealt with uh, restaurant owners uh, who opened and closed restaurants for the past five years, especially with the COVID-19. So, and uh, next, uh, our feature, next story, would cover these uh, shops, small-scale shops with historical history uh, in Gyeonggye, Incheon areas, as well as um, these uh, stands, these food stands. Um, and I believe that our analysis would begin in earnest in November when the candidates for each party would be confirmed. And so we're in the we're in the preparatory stage for that. And the articles and big kinds analysis and keyword analysis are something that we do. But aside from that, uh, we also uh, assess the positive and negative sentiments towards each candidates. So to date, we have given more weight to trends in opinion polls and portals. Uh, so going forward, we will give more weight to trends in opinion polls and port portals. And so that we would be able to foster easier understanding of the people when they read such articles. And when we publish big data-based articles, we mostly use big kinds. And we want to reinforce that collaboration. And to do so, uh, we want to diversify the use of big kinds, and we also want to uh, incorporate the big kinds analysis with the analysis of other data. So to that end, uh, we would, uh, so as a result, uh, we would want to make our big data analysis more sophisticated and reinforce our cooperation with big kinds. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Lee Han Bit, for your wonderful presentation. So, as a person at Korea Press Foundation, it gives me great pleasure to see that you're making an active use of big kinds. And it also gives me time for a self uh, reflection, you know, because I don't use big kinds as much as you do. But anyway, uh, based on your presentation, it really. It you know, reminded us of the importance of uh, how important it is to uh, make sure that these features are done in a continuous basis. And now the next presentation will be given by Ms. Choi Yuna, and uh, she will give us a presentation titled Gender Data Blank. So please go ahead. Good afternoon. I am Choi Yuna and Gender Team of the Special Content Bureau of Han Shinman. Very nice to see you. Since April, I was working for this gender team. It's been about seven months, therefore. So ever since I joined this team, I've been working on this project of filling the blank. Our official series have been finished after the fifth one, but there were so many other reactions. Now we extended our number of series up to nine so far. So we have the concept of gender data vacuum that might not be familiar to many of you. Before coming to this team, I was responsible for the publishing. And also I had a review of the book called The Invisible Women. So I took the concept from there. So if men are set as default, that's the society we're living in right now. And that gives some disadvantage or even some kind of risk to women living together. So Caroline Corrado Perez, who was the author living in the UK showed us the examples of having the vacuums for women. So while 
writing the review of the book, I wanted to have some sort of Korean version of that book. Then I was moved to gender team and I wanted to realize my dream. So that's how I started to plan this. I was inspired by the British writer of that book. Nevertheless, there are so many differences between the UK and Korea. I couldn't rely on the book written by a British person wholly, so I had to seek other things. That is something I took from Korea. So we had two laws. The one is Framework Act of Gender Equality and the other was Statistics Act. If we combine these two acts together, when we have the statistics that is related to the nation and the local governments, we have to have a division of the statistics by gender. Only with exception of the cases when it is believed that there is no benefit to divide the gender or it is difficult to do so, we have to do the division. So there are so many difficulties in getting the statistics to know whether which gender that is. So we had to change and follow the law. So is it really possible? So this is the checkpoint list that I had. First of all, we have to ask ourselves whether this is human statistics, statistics related to people. Second question is that will there be a difference if we have division by gender? Third question is about the presence of any statistics that has not been open in order to realize and read the realities of women. So is there any hidden statistics so far? So I had four items out of this concept. So there are four things. Number one is gender violence. The second one is recruitment of in gender decrease discrimination. And the third one is maternity leave. And the fourth one is industry safety. According to the life cycle of women, these four things are playing very important roles, but we haven't had any attention onto these. So let's start with the gender violence. This is from my own article. So the one, one, two, the statistics. Is it human statistics or not? That's my question to you. I believe that this is human statistics. Who's reporting the police? People do. But the police says that it's only a number of cases and that there is no need for them to divide by gender. Then we have to respond to them, why do we have to have the gender division and what purpose or benefits we can enjoy? That's the role and job of me as a journalist. I visited a police office and also they showed me that it all they have their own statistics internally with the division of gender and also by age. If they divide it by gender, do you see anything different that you haven't seen before? I asked the policeman and we showed together that it is possible to see something different. For example, the reporting is made by men by the 3.3 times, but males are reporting mostly for the administrative affairs, but women are reporting to the police because of the very severe crimes they are in. So by gender, we clearly see the difference here. Another difference, when males are calling the 112 and they call the police, the police are going to the men and the police have the tendency of extending the period of investigating the person, if that person is a male. When, well, on the other hand, women are calling the police. Police come in and police just stop by and they tend to leave only by after making several questions. Also, the actions taken after calling the police have been, found, have been found different between male and female. So I asked this around to the police again. So they said that they're going to have the division of statistics by gender in terms of the calling out to the police. You might wonder why I am so up, obsessed with this calling the police. And this is related to the hidden crimes. So this hidden crime is something that we want to discover. For example, we have the date violence, and we have the uh, stalking by the uh, lo lovers, and there are the very hidden crimes in our society. We're not exposing those crimes normally. That is why I was obsessed with the number of calls to the police, and this is something that I had to uncover. 190,000 calls have been made by the males, but only police 
came to the caller in 50,000 occasions only. What happened to the two-thirds of them? They just dissipated, no reaction to female callers. So if we have the statistics like this and show that to the authorities, they will probably make different reactions. Let's move on very quickly. This is another case. Recently, we have a very common idea about this. And we have spouse killing. So wives are sometimes killed by their husbands. How many of them are actually the case? I was trying to pursue that. But to my surprise, there was no knowing about it. I had to count each and every article that carried the crime. I was wondering why. I now learned that why we couldn't find the statistics. And the police had the categorization of the killers when it comes to the homicide. Out of the 15 categories that they, the police have, spouse is not one of them. So only they have the relative. The relative means brothers, parents, sons and daughters, and also spouses. So if the spouses are included in the category of relatives, then we cannot see correctly what is really happening in terms of the gender homicide. So I also asked this to the police to change, but there is no response yet to me. The second criteria they have is about the gender discrimination and the recruitment. And I overhear many times that the final interview is filled with women, but there's no women that I know of getting the job. So in order to know the gender discrimination in the recruitment, we have to know the ratio of the applicants and the ratio of the final successful candidates. There must have been some kind of the bias to the gender. In terms of the recruitment, in our assumption, when this issue of gender differentiation was a big issue in the society, the government once had a decree onto the companies and the public corporations to report and record how many of them are women and how many of them are men. Unfortunately, however, there was no mandatory penalty there. There's no duty to disclose it. So I was in a, a reporter with the beat on that um, at the Ministry of Economy and Finance. I asked him about that, and he said, oh, we're doing very well. Doing well was the only answer I got. Also, I delved into this more about the public corporations, about the interviews. Uh, four, of, uh, four out of six didn't care about this recording anymore. So I wrote this article again like this, and I also asked this request to the Ministry of Economy and Finance, and they were nudged by me to form a task force to manage the gender differentiation in the interviews for the final job interview. The third one, third life cycle for women, is about the maternity leave. This is actually guaranteed by law, as you know. A woman having the baby should have at least three months of maternity leave. However, what I hear from the people in the companies are different because you know, many of the women said that and I am not allowed to have the maternity leave by my boss. So I was wondering how many of them are using this and how many of them are actually in there. And I, to my surprise, announced there was no record of the maternity leave, and the Ministry of Employment was also responsible for this. I asked the ministry, what criteria are you using to have the recording of this? And they answered me that they have the number of the employed women in their system. But you see here the number of absolute number of the people who are getting married is get low, get lower and lower, while the number of people who are using the potential leave is going up. So I wasn't sure about the interpretation of this graph, but I asked also the Ministry of Employment about this issue, and I'm waiting for their reply. Since my time has elapsed, I'll be in a speedy. 
So the, we have statistics for the industrial accident. So that's also human statistics, right? Therefore, I should have the request for the division by gender in terms of the industrial accidents. Whenever there is a industrial accident, there is a committee for the industrial accident to say whether this is a industrial accident or not. In the recognition ratio of the industrial accidents, there has never been a division by gender so far. However, recently ILO, International Labor Organization, said that it is mandatory for the industries to have the division by gender in terms of the number of industrial accidents. The reason is as follows. The industrial accidents for women are mostly minor in their workplaces, and they are mostly disregarded. That is why they do not have the statistics for female. In about 2015, I also had a chance to have a look at the recognition ratio by gender for the industrial accidents. 46% of the women have been recognized, while 36.5% of women were recognized. It means that also they have the differences in getting the recognition. The committee of the industrial accident approval were consisting of 80% of men, and they also followed their criteria in the written form, and the written form of the criteria was really biased to the males. For example, they also have the criteria of having the places where the high-risk industries are there. If it is a furnace, that is categorized into the high-risk job. However, the kitchen work is not categorized as a high-risk job. As you know, furnace is mostly men's place, and the kitchen is mostly women's place. So I asked the ministry that this could be a problem. You should have the division by gender about the statistics, and they gave me a very positive response. So if you think of the industrial accident, you normally think of male properties, and they are required to have the safety boots and safety helmets. But mostly, when if you really look at the supplies of these safety equipment, they're mostly for men. So it's not just about the data, but also about the awareness of the people in actuality. So we sh should also be able to have the boots for women as well when it comes to safety. Now, let's talk about the process of purification of data. We should have some kind of criteria of doing that. So the invisible women, the British writer says that this kind of discrimination does not come from the hatred, but from the disregard or the non-recognition of the bias. So in the process of data purification, bias happens. For example, I told you about the calls to the 112 to the police. When I called the police that they have to have the division of the statistics by gender, their reply, initial reply to me is that we might have some false alarms, and we should not think of the false alarms as well. If, if especially when it's called by women. But I told you that two-thirds of the calls have not been responded by the police. The only 50 out of 165,000 were only responded. So we cannot say that all two-thirds of them are false alarms. So you should have the division of the statistics by gender. And also, we have to have the checking of the data before you read it. So once you read a data or number, please do not take it for granted. You have to double check, and you have to ask your question if the data is right or incorrect. So I myself was believing what I see, but this project enabled me to have a fresh look at what I see as a data. So we need to have a out-of-box thinking. Now, 
Last but not least, I would like to ad advise you that you have to look at what others mean in a second chance, even if it is silent. So you have to look at the silent others. For example, we have the irregular hemorrhage by women after vaccination of COVID-19. And they are just classified as other items, even if they have the irregular hemorrhage. Therefore, in the section of others, we can know exactly or in detail how many women are suffering irregular hemorrhage. And then also I was able to see the section of others, and mostly this section called others, are full of the sufferings of women. Normally when we want to just call something into the category of others, there might be the minor things and collection of minor things, but that is not true. For example, if you look at this graph here, on the far right, that's others, and that others is the biggest among all the bar graphs here. That's about the selection of the supervision issues, and the issues are like, for example, they have the penalties for theft, and also they have the non-implementation of the working conditions, and they have the non-payment of the retirement, and so on. But in this other section, at the far right, we cannot know of the details of this. If I ask this question, they said that I have to go to the National Assembly members to get the final data because the lawmakers are the final ones to have this information. So as I have briefly explained to you, these cases are more and more in number, even if I cannot see them. So I really ask my colleagues to look into these things more than I do. Thank you very much. So I agreed with a lot of things that were said through your presentation. And a statistics that I've looked at is based on the fact that uh, you know there is a gender difference uh, in people who deal with data today and I believe that perhaps that could be a factor influencing the outcomes that you shared with us and then BBC they admitted or they looked into uh, the gender ratio um, of uh, the uh, people involved in article publishing and they're actually manually making records of that at BBC so those things it's a topic of interest in press all over the world and thank you so much for the two presentations they were very helpful so we have a 10 minute Q&A session and if you would leave your questions in the YouTube chat box uh, we would appreciate it so we do have a question on YouTube so there are many housework services these days and sometimes women are victim of crime of people who come for those services and are those crimes also quote unquote calculated as industrial accidents well, in my short analysis, what's measurable as industrial accidents is dependent upon the report. Therefore, if it is about the sexual assault, we have to have the reporting in there, and we have to have the application to the Committee of the Diseases related to the occupation. But there is a problem here. I told you about the problem and trap of the others. So if you talk about the household services, that's also in the category of others. So you cannot know exactly how many of them are the victims of sexual assaults or any other industrial accidents, if, even if, if you are not going to the National Assembly. So it means that once you apply for this, you can be the subject of that uh, issue, but otherwise you are not in the you're not appearing in the statistics because that's in the others. Ms. Che, we have to you have to answer the next question as well. It's my it's many people's first time to know that there is a gender team in Hangyeore Shinmun, so they want to know what details are they actually made in your team. In relation to that, probably in the media, are you planning to open the data that you have as a media? First of all, 
has gender team as you have discovered now. This is for the first time as a media company in Korea. What we are doing, we are covering anything related to gender. More directly, of course, we are dealing with the male issues as well. However, what is important here is that we are not dealing with the dichotomy of male and female only because gender has wider spectrum, like you know, like the Lieutenant Pyon, who was you know, transgender, uh, also had the problem of this. So we have the issues of all the people suffering the gender issue. So we cover all of them, actually. So even if there's a male, they, if they, the male is suffering the social discrimination because of the gender, or the male wants to indicate some problems and loopholes of the system, we are welcoming them as well. The third question is about the media. I am not quite sure what kind of data are you referring to, but I am willing to open my data of my own. So if we have the contract here, any journalist would agree with me that we are not experts in one area. So if there is something I left, please, I want to be picked by experts. So I need the support by experts as well. The fourth one, can I answer that question as well? Second, the fourth question will be read by me. So actually, I have this question. In the process of reporting, what kind of ways can you have in order to find the others? Well, I actually, a student of the liberal arts, I didn't study STEM, so I am very clumsy about numbers. But I had to read a lot of reports in here, so many number of, so many reports. And many of them have briefly mentioned the issues of the others. And the, uh, the graph of others, mostly, as you see, are very thick and big. So they just wanted to just briefly touch upon that. And I became very obstinate about that. I asked and asked many questions to them. That is why I was so much interested in the others. Yes, I am interested in knowing what you have. So if you are willing to open your data, I'm the first one to, who gets it, right? Now, Mr. Lee. So you are a journalist, and for data journalists, um, the environment for them is rather poor. I'm talking about the working environment, and if I look at some of the presentations that were made, it looks like they've been done by the data journalists alone and not with other people. So can you talk about the circumstances uh, facing, working circumstances facing data journalists today? So as you see, said, here in Jungbo Ilbo, yeah, we are part of the local news outlet. And compared to central news outlet, we have fewer number of people. And we don't have many methodologies available. So I had to do my own research about how to do these analyses. And I've always uh, took part in like training workshops and so on. And yes, I'm the only only person engaged in this at my company, and for this to become more sophisticated, I would have to make use of more diverse statistical tools and so on. So I always try to make sure that I attend related workshops and seek for collaboration. But people have different areas of expertise, and so most of the analyses are done myself. So that's one of the poorest working conditions for me. But you know, studying about big data analyses and learning about it really allows me to learn new things. And it encourages me to study deeper. But because I'm one person and there are so many things for me to do, uh, I don't. I am not able to do all of those things that I just mentioned. Yes, it's a lonely task as I hear it. But you know, I know that you are studying a lot and researching a lot on your own. And I do hope that these working conditions would be improved with this conference. And I am part of the Korea Press Foundation, but uh, and I really appreciate your using big kinds. 
So I'm sure it has its advantages or merits, but it would also have its disadvantages or dismerits. So can you share some of that with us? So I've been using Bitcoins for the past year, and based on my experience, there has been a renewal done on Bitcoins. And as I was doing my planning and doing my analyses, there were some things that I wanted Bitcoins to provide. And with the renewal, some functions were added. And visualization has been reinforced. And therefore, I've been using a lot of that visualization function. However, you mostly show the amount of newspaper art news articles, but these objective statistics are good, but maybe you could also provide some other statistics, like, for example, um, how many articles are in relation to that, and so on, so because that will save me a lot of time, because I'm the one who has to make the discernment now and uh, do my own analysis, so maybe big kinds could add some new functions to help me to do my analysis in an easier manner, uh, to do it in a more sophisticated manner as well. Yes, I do certainly hope so as well. So this is my personal question to Ms. Cheyuna. I myself am a researcher of data-related things. That's why I'm asking this question to you. I was very much impressed by your presentation. I found my own dilemma as a researcher upon hearing from you. There are visible data. On the other hand, there are invisible data as well. Machines are actually ruling the world nowadays. They are also learning things, right? So the machine learning. So when it comes to people, you know, gender bias can be understood and learned by machine learning, and we can expose them now. But invisible data you mentioned is really something that I can concur with. But when we use the machine in learning, there can be a case when bias is also learned by the machine. So this may another side effect that we do not want to have. How can we solve the problem? I know that there is no answer to that right now, but let's explore that together, how we can solve the problem. Ms. Choi, I would like to ask you what your, your ideas are about solving the bias issue. Well, as you said, there's no answer to me either. But there is one case I can tell you. The police, regarding the number of the calls to the 112, they can put it into the algorithm in order to improve the safety and policing. And that's what they announced before. And the 112 is also related to the number of calls, but they do not have the division of the data by gender. What I requested first and foremost is to have the division of the number of calls to 112 by gender. That is the starting point. Without having the starting point, we cannot have a clue at all. Yes, I wanted to give the solution to this. I am not capable of doing that. As I mentioned, I believe that the completeness of the raw data would be very, very important. With this conference as a momentum, I'd like to ask the awareness of all the people of the importance of this. Our time has passed. We have to stop here for the Q&A session. Thank you very much for your presentations and the answers. Thank you. Uh, next, we will see pieces that won the Korea Data Journalism Awards. So, uh, the first presentation is Land of Extinct by uh, Mr. Lee hyung at KBS Taiwan. And the second is the if we won the Innovation Award, and it's titled Beyond the School Zone by Mr. Pyeon jin -kyo. And the third one won the Open Data Awards, and it's titled Lobbying Strategies of Japan. It will be given by Mr. Nam jae After all the presentations are over, we will have a 10-minute Q&A session. Then let's take a look at the coverage case of Land of the Instinct. Hello, I am from KBS Taiwan and I am from the uh, in-depth or uh, planning team and I'm, my name is Yi Hong Guan. 
And first of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present here. I'm not sure if I should be the one standing up here on stage. It's my team members who did all the work. But nevertheless, um, on behalf of my team, I would like to tell you what this piece covered, what it focused on, and so on. So let's take a look at the screen first. So this is a screen capture of a documentary. I'm sure you heard of the, about the book Local Extinction that was published in 2014. And after it was published, it stirred up controversies in Korea about the issue of a population disappearing in local areas or rural areas. But we looked at it from a different angle. You know, local extinction is a familiar term, and we all know that rural population is disappearing, but no one has seen the or examined into the severity of this issue. So I've lived in the metropolitan area all my life, so I asked my friends, you know, what do you know about local extinctions? And this is what they answered. So isn't it about villages disappearing? appearing in rural areas? Well, what does that have to do with me when I live in the metropolitan area? So people are not aware that this issue is a crisis. And we thought that people don't deem this as a crisis because the media has not played its role. So when dealing with local extinction, uh, the media usually pretty much shows the same pattern. Um, in the central news, it's about the sa same. And, um, and it's the same for rural or local news as well. They would show you some unoccupied houses and listen to old women talk about the issue and show some macro statistics, and that's about it. It's almost as if it's like a fixed pattern. But I believe that these are these. This kind of media report uh, does not actually convey the seriousness of the problem to the public. So we wanted to do things differently this time. So that was kind of like the aim of the team. So we wanted to make a report on not the phenomenon itself, but uh, we wanted to report it in depth. So, in-depth report would provide details, concrete details and granular details. And the first, first goal that we set is that we wanted to deal with the current status of local extinction and all across the nation. And we want to find out the causes based on data and in present date, what kind of alternative can we suggest? So those are the three things that we wanted to achieve with regards to local instinction. So this project was actually a documentary. So we do have a documentary made by reporters at our company. And the documentary title was Land of the Extinct. And it's about 54 minutes. And 54 minutes was not enough time to cover the seriousness of the issues and its details. So we wanted to find some other format that could better deliver a more amount of information that we collected. And therefore, we made this interactive news page. So interactive news page, as far as I understand, although I'm not an expert in it, it combines video, text, and data, visualized effects, so as to enable the readers to experience the news in a new way. So we don't have a specific dedicated team for interactive news. So my team members really worked hard to make this page. And this is a uh, satellite imagery by a satellite in NASA. And you can see these artificial lights uh, being flickering in certain areas. But some areas, it's dark. And that really shows how population is decreasing in rural areas. So a video, once you go into this interactive page, you can see a video clip, and I'll share that with you.
인구가 계속 줄면 그 지방 자체가 사라질 수도 있습니다. 30년 안에 30% 가까운 자치단체가 없어질 거라는 경고가 나왔습니다. 저도 기회가 되면 떠나고 싶어요. 전부 좋은 데로 가고 사람도 안 다녀. 3만 명이 안 되는 자리에 상가들이 보시다시피 너무 많이 건축이 되다 보니까 공실이 지금 발생이 안될 수가 없는 거예요. 이 병원이 없다고 보면 은 상당히 불안하죠. 목숨마저도 차별을 정부에서 한다 하면 은 이거는 정말로 붕괴하지 않을 수 없는 사안이 되겠습니다. 지방 소멸이 이미 거의 완성 단계예요. 사망만 존재하는 거죠. 한가롭게 얘기할 게 아니에요. 이 흐름을 막지 못하면 공멸을 하는 거죠. 근데 이게 그 인터랙티브 스페이스에 가면은. So if you go to the interactive news page, uh, you will see this video clip as a prologue. So there was a reason for us to put in this video clip. We really wanted our users and readers to experience as many things as possible, and that's why we put in this video clip. And I've captured some of uh, the screens. And as you can see, we have reflected the voices of the people that live in these local areas. And we have also included card news. Uh, actually, I think we, in retrospect, I think we were being greedy, but uh, that we really wanted to provide as many things as possible to the readers. Uh, so, so the, again, the main objective of the page was interactive storytelling, and it focuses on user experience. So, mouse scrolls and clicks were utilized as part of the function, and uh, the people in our development uh, helped us in doing that. And also, the amount of text has been controlled as well. And what we really wanted to emphasize is the visualization of data. So there are two areas in reporting that is on the same reporting and data. And we really wanted to get some detailed data, so we called Statistics Korea to obtain micro data. And afterwards, uh, we had to do a lot of Excel spreadsheet work. So we do have outcome of the analysis in the interactive news page, but there were much more information that, that some things were not used. But uh, we had we used uh, data that could be visualized uh, because we thought too much data uh, could actually uh, be ineffective in delivering the message that we aim for. And so so therefore, we made this map that shows unoccupied houses in Korea. And while uh, conducting this project, we got some expert advice. And what we really wanted to uh, make this map stand out from others is that we wanted it to show these unoccupied houses in town level, township level, and uh, also district level. And I'm sure you all then this is a map of a Station risk. I'm sure you've seen this in the media. And we, with together with the expert, uh, created this map based on data. And the unoccupied house map and extinction risk map all talk about the same thing. But the reason why we put those two together is because you know there is something called the 2020 uh, local extinction risk map. And there are some people who raise concerns or uh, criticism about this map, so we wanted to put it together with the unoccupied houses to address those concerns or criticisms. And this is the map that took the most amount of effort. Uh, it's called a cartogram map. I'm sure you heard about cartogram method. So the cartogram is a thematic map in which the geographic size is altered proportional to the number of population. And we have actually gotten this idea from the report of Ministry of Land and Transportation. And we thought that there is a need to provide a map that really shows the seriousness of the issue. And the data that we use is from 1966 to 2020. And uh, there were just so many, but we could not upload all of them because uh, on online. So 
we have just you know divide them into a 10 year interval and you know about the island of Tokdo the you know making Tokdo into a data and putting it in this map took a long period of time and we thought about leaving it out but if Tokdo is left out of the picture that could also uh, create another controversy so we managed to create Tokdo so this all uh, everything so these lines uh, indicate uh, the population leaving and so on so leaflets and heat map are some of the techniques that are all familiar to you so I'm not going to share that in detail so I don't have a lot of time given to me so I'm going to conclude my presentation so this is the uh, image that is shown at the end of the interactive news and it's the uh, shot of the city of Seoul and I wanted to talk about the power of visualization through this image so there's a massive amount of data available and you know we would put them in Excel sheet and if we were to analyze them that's great but if we don't deliver them in the effective way it's not going to be useful so we really hope that going forward we will be able to see more visualized data being used and creating interactive news page has been challenging because of the existing circumstances so we had to ask helps of our friends and acquaintances in creating this but we've never met face to face offline we worked via the telephone and zoom and that was possible, as you could see. But I do hope that local news outlets would create pieces like this uh, more going forward. And so this interactive news is mostly focused in central news agencies these days, but I do hope that local newspaper outlets would have more role to play in the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. You know, data visualization and press coverage is using them. When I see these cases, you know, it really makes me emotional because I can really tell that you've worked so hard. And now we will hear from Ms. Pyeon Jin Kyung, Beyond the School Zone, which won the award for innovation. Good afternoon. My name is Pyeon Jin Kyung, team leader of the Social Affairs in Shisa Inn. I was very much honored to be awarded for the KDJA for innovation. So we had our project called Beyond School Zones. This is my presentation from now on. Before I share the content of the reporting, I'd like to start with saying some episodes I experienced while reporting. This is about data and people and their stories. As we have the data conference here, as many journalists have experienced so far, we are based on the Excel spreadsheet before getting into the real story. So the accidents of children on the school zone areas was also started based on the data like this. When we had this one file of Excel spreadsheet, we didn't know what to do more afterwards. What else can we say and what other things can we uncover in the beginning? As you see, in the Excel spreadsheet, we have the dates of the accidents of the children in the school zones, weather and the timing, what kind of drivers are there, what kind of cars, the age of children, and the gender of the children. But with this raw data, the power of the article would not be achieved with this raw data only. So we were there into the site, accident site. So we took pictures of that. The people were just intermingled together between the cars and the children. That was kind of a place where we went to on a business trip. That was actually a place where road accidents were frequent. And also I was holding the big patches of the Excel spreadsheet. I looked around the street. I was talking with the people selling things over there. I also talked to children over there. Have you seen any accident or have you felt any danger while you are riding here? And what do you need in order to improve the safety and so on? And very mysteriously, I actually found one child in the Excel file. So it was amazing because I was able to see the real figure of the 
one line of the Excel file. That child had experienced the accident. I happen to know the child because another child told me that, oh, I had a friend who had been hit by a car. So it was two years before, and she was hit by a car, and it took her two years to have been walking in the gifts, and they had to go to school that way. And I was happy to see her, but I shouldn't be happy to know her, right? So, but you know, I was trying to ask questions to her, and she was very afraid of answering my questions. And she said, and this reporter, I don't want to be interviewed. So I just you know, came to my senses. What am I doing to this kind of child? And her friend told me that you know, she had gone through a lot of difficult times. She couldn't play with us because she was could not walk, and she had to, to be on crutches going back and from school. So before meeting the child, I was thinking data only. She was one of my data. But after meeting and talking to her, I realized that my data is real people. So if you look at the red line here, that's her. Then oh, that's the very good weather day, and 60-year-old driver was driving by, and it was actually a boy, not a not a girl. The boy was hit by the car in the severe injury. If you read the word severe injury, that doesn't make sense that much to you. You have to have the number. For example, you know, the treatment required uh, six weeks. Although it says it requires six weeks, I don't know anything about her story of the sufferings after the accident. But I happened to just have found her, for him, and he uh, can kind of uh, show his sufferings. I tried to imagine as much as possible about the accident and the victims and so on. So I had to imagine the weather and the street and so on. So I had no other options but to go there, be there as well. These are the dots and in the data of the accidents. One dot means one child. One dot means the accident for a child. And also one dot means the age of the child. With this, I use my imagination. I walk around the frequent places of the children, from library to school, from library to school to home. And I was wondering why this child was in the accident. Was it going to the private school after school? And so I was imagining myself in their itinerary. So this is a heat map. The red areas are the most frequent accident areas. The red might mean killing as well. This is the picture of the whole South Korea. So we have the street accidents for children to be hit by some vehicles, to be severely injured or killed. This is a visualization of all the accidents. Simply looking at it, you might not feel the pain in here. You only see the number of dots here, but all the dots here represent the tragedy of the children in the school zones. Let's go back to each dot. This accident was also nearby the school area. So this is very frequent an area for accidents. What do you think the red dot is? So if you look at the Excel data at the bottom, it was September 11th of 2019 in the Asan city of Chungseong Namdo. He was in the crossings. At that time, there was no traffic light. And the 42-year-old truck driver male hit the seven-year-old boy and killed him. You know this incident so well. His name is Kim Min-sik. Kim Min-sik is named after the act made and legislated afterwards, after this accident. This one accident became the reason for me to be in this reporting in our society regarding this min sik or act on the aggravated punishment of specific violent crimes and road traffic act. But if you look at this picture, you might have different idea because this is the application for games for children. This is how to go through the this act, and this is a game for children to play to 
avoid narrowly avoid accident. This child in the game is teasing the driver, and if the child is hit by the car, the car becomes the criminal, and the child becomes the victim. And the game ends when the car was actually hit by the child and have the crumbling down and the children playing this are giggling. This is the reality we have now. So these are the actual showings of these reactions by the people in the YouTube. And you see those children playing the game I showed you before. And this is the view in the picture taken by the cameras, not by the human eyes. So this is the perspective of the car looking into the streets and the children on the street. And then they were just you know, criticizing children only because the children were not high enough to see the cars and the drivers. But in the past, we were just you know, simply mocking those you know, children not being careful. So this is my imagination again. And I imagined if black box is installed in the eyes of the children, because we have been looking things from the adults perspectives and the black boxes perspectives. So if we have black boxes for the children's eyes and their, at their height, we might have a different conclusion. This is one of the videos I received from the relevant authorities. So this is you know, Google Glass and Action Cams attached onto the eyes of the children, and we let them walk on the street. And so when they walk in the street, we now know what the height level these children's eyes are. And in the video, just because that car suddenly comes in. This child might have been playing the Minshigi play or game. So they are the ones who have the different perspectives from the adults. I myself have been into the many places. I've been to the crossings. I've been to the areas with no traffic signs. I and my team members have been scattered around to see all these areas in the school zone, outside school zone. I wanted to see what the children of the height of 100 meter, centimeters up to 130 centimeters to see are seeing. So I wanted to check out all the dangerous parts and the difficult points for them to see. Whether it's a school zone or whether it is outside the school zone is not that important. Children might be hit and be killed inside and outside the school zones. It's about the human beings. It's about the human safety. We should have the policy to guarantee the safety of the people, whether they are children or adult. Another thing that I would like to emphasize here is the distance and gap. The gap is felt in between different levels of the people. So the wealthier people have less problems or safety issues while the other thing happens on the other side of the spectrum. So if you go back to this heat, I mean, this map here, we had to know the assumption. And if the assumption is going to working as our you know, thinking, we had to check. So probably we had our assumption that pro those in the poor neighborhood might be hit more by cars. So we wanted uh, to prove the assumption also hoping that our assumption can be wrong, ironically. But our assumption was not wrong, because we were able to confirm that the wealthy neighborhoods have less accidents. And the other story also is happening, happening true. So the number of accidents in the streets, inside the school zones, in the wealthier neighborhoods, as everybody knows, the number of accidents is quite low. So if you look at this, and we have a simple conclusion, probably the wealthy neighborhood is good for child rearing. We have to move to the safer places after making a lot of money. That's the conclusion of the regular people. But I would ask you to think otherwise, because you have to think of the safety factors and the risk factors in the wealthy neighborhood and an unwealthy neighborhood, respectively. So we wanted to find in these kind of elements to be implemented. I went back to the sites. So my conclusion is as follows. Data is nothing in itself without 
the use of it. If you have the story that you want to tell, data becomes powerful. But no story, no power of the data. Let's go back to the dots here. So this is the area with frequent accident records, and this is the residential area. Recently, because of this secondary rows coming in, they have a lot of accidents nowadays. Students were going to school in the morning. I observed them. I found one thing very interesting. Children was passing through a very small alley. It was just in the building, and there's open space. They were just going into that. If you expand the map here, this building looks very different and particular. They have the passage here. Children passes through this street to go to school. I asked the a vendor of the uh, shop here what that road is for, the passage is for. And he said that he's the owner of the building, and he actually made the exit here. He was worried about the safety of the children several years ago so that they can not get hit by the cars. So when he built the building, he intentionally made open passage so that small children can walk through. Actually, the children were walking through this, and they, their the ratio of accidents is quite low as proven. I asked him once again, why did you do that? If that open space becomes an indoor space, you can make more money. You can get the renters like a one, one, uh, 15 million won per year. Why is that? And he said that, of course, I know that I can make money for from this space, but I wanted to see safe children. I wanted to see the safety of the children. So it was very much an impressive. And also, he was you know, covered by a newspaper. And KBS, NBC, you know, the morning uh, programs have been covering him as well. Actually, he uh, was not known very well until I discovered it. Only the neighbor, neighbors were just talking about him doing that. This has been somewhat old, but this is an interactive web page. We started. We wanted to have the more viral programs, and they became viral later on. We also took a lot of videos using the drones sometimes, or 360-degree VRs were also created. Ocus Corpus was used as a motion picture capture mode. If you come to our site, you can watch all these things. AR was also used, so everything is for the children's safety area. Under the title, we also had the augmented reality videos. Chisa In is a newspaper and the magazine in paper. We have the full story about this in the issue 324. So if you're interested, please take a look at this. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very much impressive. I am a subscriber of Shisa In, your magazine. So with this, I believe that you know, I just made sense of my paying membership to Shisa In with this article only. That is you know, worth more than my subscription per year. Thank you very much. And now we'll move on to the next presentation. Mr. Nam Jae-hyun from MBC will be the speaker. Hello, my name is Nam Jae-hyun from the MBC. See Project News, and it's not just me who've done all the researchers. Uh, we have four on the scene reporters and four to six uh, researchers in the team. So all our collaborative work was put together to produce this output, and each reporter took one item. And so after doing the pre-report, uh, we dove into the topic uh, to really begin the reporting in earnest. So this is a coverage that I've done in February, and it's called Lobby Strategies of Japan. And it all began from the white list. So, you know, that's related to trade regulations and the trade regulation, the effect of trend regulation still continues to date. And we wonder why that is so. Um, so during when the third North Korea 
um, U.S. summit was held. Uh, we thought that this would provide a momentum for Korea, but all of a sudden, Japan uh, put regulations on exportation to Korea. Uh, so. What we did was to try to pursue the politicians and the media in the United States, but you know, given that the effect of uh, trade regulation still continues, I believe that Japan's lobbying is more powerful than that of Korea today. And so our first conclusion is that this is called the K Street in Washington, D.C. And all the lobby uh, companies in the United States is concentrated in K Street. And uh, the Lobby companies that are registered in the U.S. government are up, there are about 505 of them. So when comparing Korea and Japan in terms of their lobbying strategies, uh, we can see that uh, it was 170 for Japan and 120 for Korea in terms of their contact uh, to oh, lobby companies. And uh, in the Abe administration, that was 55. And uh, Korea remains at half of that level, according to data. As I said before, if you engage in lobbying activities, uh, so in the United States, lobbying is legal, so you need to register uh, under the Foreign Agent Registration Act. So this is the FAR website, and in every six months, the lobby companies will have to register if they are commissioned by other companies to do carry out lobby activities. So we've never looked at it in detail, although we knew about its existence, and you will have a clearer understanding in the later part of my presentation, but it's like this in the website. So we selected several items, like Gisomia, for example, but we only saw a few materials. So we uh, searched for Comfort Woman, but there were not that many materials as we expected. So. You know, there were a lot of controversies among the team as to the amount of data that we would collect. But so what we did is that we would just search Japan and search Korea and look at all the outcomes from those searches. So from 1942, uh, so we collected data from 1942 that included the word Japan and Korea, and we filtered out everything and we organized them. And we had, we were down to 290 documents that we had to examine. And so the, of course, the companies not only have to register at FARA, but they also have to make inter and report to the U.S. government, so there were more documents to see. And these documents could be divided into three, supplemental statement, exhibit, and informational materials. So exhibit is about, you know, it's basically a contract uh, between a certain entity and the lobbying company and what activities will be carried out and so on. And as for the supplemental statement, it shows uh, what lobbyists met whom at what date. It's very specific. Uh, but uh, it's specific, but not all the granular details are uh, offered. Uh, mostly, you can see them through the title. And the information materials, you can see the outcome of the lobby. For example, uh, were there uh, article contributions made in the news outlets and so on. So we categorize them into five. So what company did the Japanese government hire? How much money did they use? And what agenda was a top, top item of lobby? And who did the lobby company meet and when? And what's also really significant is a political support fund. And uh, who did Japan give its political support fund to? And that's also the same for Korea. And this is the outcome. These are the Excel spreadsheets. So we put the names of the each lobbying company, their affiliation, and the people who they met, and the affiliation of the people that they met. Are they part of the Congress? Are they the members of the Senate or the House of Representatives? Or are they a think tank and so on? So as I said before, there are three types of materials or documents. And what really was challenging is that we were not able to copy and paste everything, but we had to check everything and highlight them to see what data is needed for us and what is not needed, and we had to make 
make them into Excel files and save them like this. So that was really challenging for us. So this is our preliminary outcome. So if you look at the fund, uh, you know, Japan's fund provided to the United States is about 2.5 times higher than that of Korea. It is $99 million for Japan and $39 million for Korea. So if you look at the amount, you might think that it's smaller than you expected because it's from the 1940s. But when we first began this coverage, we, we contacted the consulate, the embassies, and all of these public organizations or diplomatic organizations. But Japan actually does a lot of diplomacy behind the door, contacting many civil organizations. So while the, the amount may look small, the actual amount is greater than this, because this only reflects the amount that went into uh, governmental organizations or diplomatic organizations. And if we look at the number of documents that were made with regards to the lobbying activities, it's around 600 for Korea and 1,500 for Japan. So you can see that there is a more than twofold difference so we took a look at the keywords and put them into Excel. And if you look at the keywords, you can really see what kind of lobby activities Japan was involved in and also Korea. So let's take a look at the keywords. Uh, so for Korea, it's COVID or bilateral relations or the visa issue, whereas for Japan, contrary to our expectation, it was about invitation, briefing, and embassy, and travel, and even baseball. So so many topics are items of lobbying activity uh, for Japan. So for Korea, everything is very direct and insightful, whereas for Japan, um, their lobbying activities rather indirect and rather amicable too. So the person that I'm going to introduce is a lobbyist in Japan, a Japanese lobbyist. And I think it was the first time seeing for me uh, to uh, a Japanese lobbyist, uh, you know, doing interview on the media. People enjoy sitting down over lunch and talking with each other. And when you're trying to build relationships in Washington, that's a technique that is really valuable to observe. But they're the hosts, I should say. You know? The host is Japan, yeah. People who are in the room have a lot of power because they draft legislation. When the US is deciding on a foreign policy, Congress plays a very big role in that. The embassy. Um, does have, a, you know, a group, you know, they, they build new networks this way. So what the lobbyist was talking about is that after the export regulation and two months later, at the House of Representation, there was a resolution which stated that it would support Chisomia because at the time, the Korea stance was that we could scrap Chisomia because of the trade regulation or the export regulation. But the lobbyist actually met people at the House of Representatives and persuaded them to issue a resolution. But she did not so directly, but she just invited people and just observed, she said. But she said that people at the embassy and the lobbyists was there, were there. And we asked, and what we were really thankful is that what was really challenging when we did this work is the time difference, you know, and having to communicate through the email because there is a time difference, so, which means that we would do our reporting at 1 a.m. Korea time or a very late night. And because of the pandemic, people were not at their office, and therefore uh, the automatic uh, voice would pick up the phone. So it was very difficult for us to carry out the interview, and when we send out the email, there would be no responses. But this lobbyist from Kovan Company was so willing to 
engage in interview. So we asked some very specific questions, and I'm sure she might have found that pestering, but she was very generous with her answers about what the situation was, uh, what went on. So they uh, invited 22 people. Uh, who are related to the Congress, and other people were just watching, and they just watched as people engaged in discussion. So things were not forced, but uh, these lobbies just created an opportunity or an atmosphere in which discussion could be carried out naturally. So that was the aim of Japan. and. Uh, we see this in data. So Korea's lobbying activities is concentrated mostly on the Congress and the administration. But for Japan, it's more concentrated on the media or universities or think tanks. And this is a prime example. So this is a photo in Washington, a cherry blossom festival that was held in Washington, D.C. And this has a over a hundred year history. And there was a treaty where the Jap Japan provides 3,000 trees of cherry blossom to the United States in return for the U.S. tacitly agreeing to Japanese colonialism of Korea. So, and the thousands of uh, cherry blossoms that were planted in Washington, D.C. back at the time are still growing and festivals are held. So if you look at the right, if you you become the queen of cherry blossom, then you be invited to Japan. Japan would provide the flights and accommodations, and they would take pictures of the prime minister, and still going on. And uh, many companies are involved in this as well. And if you look at the video clip that we provided at our NBC, uh, you can see these kind of scenes that as you see in the picture. And we also dealt with political support funds. Uh, so that was also another item of our analysis. So Nancy Pelosi, who was the uh, head of the House of Representatives, is in the picture. And the f political fund given to her was $11,700 for Japan and $1,000 for Korea. And even when uh, she uh, was part of the presidential campaign, Japan managed to contact her, the Biden camp, and provide a political support fund as well, whereas Korea did not do anything. So the professor here is talking about that the biggest issue is that we don't have strategies and we lack experience. So we don't have strategy and experience, and that's the biggest problem of Korea, as stated by a professor at Kyung University. I could really resonate with his remarks. So this screen. Uh, shows the data that we disclosed, as well as some of the materials that are written in English and translated into Korean. And after we disclosed this data, it was usually the special correspondents or people at schools who were highly interested. Because as we were organizing the data and we disclosed them, people wanted to use them as uh, textbooks, for example, for learning and so on. So that was a very simple explanation of the coverage that we conducted. And it's not just us reporters who did the work, it's the researchers staying up night after night. And it was such a rewarding experience because we were able to receive the KDJA award. So anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Nam jae for your presentation. So I was part of the judging committee or the screening committee for KDJA, and we were all unanimous in uh, selecting your piece. Uh, and I'm sure you know the reason why. So I enjoyed the three presentations, and now we would like to conduct a Q&A session. So please upload your questions on the YouTube chat box, and I will address them. So there was a comment or question for Mr. Lee hyung -gwan. So I want to hear about some of the challenges uh, facing the news outlets in local areas in terms of data visualization. 
So I think I can talk about the challenges for an hour or even more. But as we were doing this work, we had to receive help from the HQ and the development team and also another person at the data journalism team. So we had to get a lot of help. And the challenge, most challenging part was visualization. So for this piece, we did not have a lot of uh, budget, so we had to ask help to our friends and acquaintances. So we also worked together with KAIST in analyzing the data. And as for front page development and design, we had one of our acquaintances doing the work for us. Uh, we had to explain about the purpose of this coverage and so that he or she could carry out the work and for local media outlets data analysis and visualization and designing is difficult because we don't have a lot of talent so we you often have to invite people in metropolitan areas and in that case we would conduct a lot of meetings via zoom and that was the case for us as well thank you so listening to these cases really makes me emotional because I can see the challenges that you face, but nevertheless, you're able to overcome the challenges and produce such excellent pieces. And we thank you for that. As a person in the media circles, I'm really happy to see these uh, excellent works. So my question goes to now, Ms. Pian. So you've been talking about your reporting on the school zone accidents. You were awarded for the innovation. And I think that the reason for you to be awarded for innovation is because the data is a story making tools for human beings. Because we're talking about the victims and also the accidents. When I read your story and also this is something i felt from reading the article as well you've been talking about the process of doing the collaboration with the outsourcing companies so you might wonder the outsourcing companies are doing the most of the job for you i know of course that that, that is not true would you like to elaborate on that yes of course, it is true that we were able to work with outsourcers. That was thanks to the financing tools by the KPF. Thank you very much for that. So you enabled me to have the collaboration with the outsourcers. Also inside our editing team, we were also discussing in what way we can show this to the readers. If it is not the special case, then we would just, of course, write it in the newspaper paper. But this is for the competition of this award, KDJA. And I wanted to show it somewhat differently. Of course, this idea came to me two years before when this law was enacted for the Minshigi Bob. And I wanted to deal with it for such a long time, but I really wanted to be differentiated because I do not want to stop showing the whining and the sorrow of the mourners, the, lo the parents who lost the child. I really wanted to refresh the mind of the general society about the safety of the children. And also, once we can get the financing for the AR and VR, we could have done something differently. I really wanted to have a chance like that because we were a very poor organization. That chance came to me with the KPF's finance. With thanks to that, we were able to do the job starting from the platform. And Mr. With the Yuan Sun was the person who has been collaborating with me for such a long time. We had our history of working together in the empty houses and Terim projects. We were just you know, making very fine partners every time we worked. So I was happy to work with him. And we talked about how we can just show it in the video. And also the image was also very important. The image team was also working with us later on. Originally, we started from the paper-based based newspaper, but we moved to the form of the images and the videos as well. For the visualization of the data, we 
also were thinking very hard about how we can realize them. We happened to ha meet an expert, and we had a very lengthy discussion. Mr. Kim Sung Bum from VWF was the person who had all the expertise. We also had a chance to meet with him before, and also we had some acquaintances of him working together. I explained the purpose of this article to him, and he was very much interested. So starting from May 6th, we started to have the meetings. Then we discussed how we can show and what we can show to the readers. So this is a combination of all the people's efforts. Thank you. You said that you're trying to know what you're trying to say, and also you have to be confident about how you can show it. So all these factors are combined together to reach a, such a good work and then be a word of the KDJA. Mr. Nam, I, I would like to ask a question to you. And so the Excel spreadsheet that you showed looked very simple, but it actually required a lot of work, and I'm very well aware of that. And I'm sure those of you who accessed the page would know, but uh, the necessary parts of those documents have been translated into Korean, and that's why people at the academia really want to make use of this data. I'm sure you receive a lot of calls. So can you but just tell us some of the challenges you faced along the way? Because I don't think you had time to talk about your challenges doing the crawling and you know manually inputting these uh, data would be would have been a very challenging experience and what can you do to improve that yes yeah, so those are very challenging but we haven't been able to find an alternative yet so as you said so the text title name time that was all that was available in the document so you know based on those data it's very difficult for us to make some estimates or assumptions, and as I said before, um, some of the challenging elements were COVID-19, the time difference, and the automatic response devices, and also emails. And you know, in that case, you know, we really needed to go to those people and confirm every single detail because, the, given the data that was available to us, we could not make any assumptions or estimations. So the phase of asking questions, uh, asking questions about uh, all the uh, words that were available in the material or the document was the most challenging part. And we thought about an alternative way to do this. Maybe we could run a program, but that was not the case. That was our conclusion that that's impossible. So we just had to be there or engage the, uh, with the people. So because we went through that process, um, we did not want you to experience the same challenge and difficulty, so we uh, translated them into Korean for you to easily take a look at. So I also want to ask a question to Mr. Lee hyung -gwan. So you said that many of the meetings happened via Zoom, and you talked about many challenges uh, that are facing local news outlets. But and you talked about it in a very easy breezy way. But I know it's not that easy. You know, just checking everything, especially when you're not having meetings face to face. I'm sure uh, was proved to be difficult. But among all those challenges. What was the biggest challenge for you? I think I can actually assume, make an assumption as to what the biggest challenge was, but maybe you could talk about some of the biggest challenges and maybe the changes that needs to be made uh, for you to overcome that challenge uh, from a structural point of view. So I can think about two things at the moment. So, you know, data, inputting data and looking at data is a tedious job. So as said by Mr. Nam Jae-hyun, aside from the data that we showed you, we really uh, hope that we can do crawling in a more efficient manner. You know, putting data that's on paper uh, to Excel sheet requires a, man a lot of manual work, and that really makes us exhausted. 
So, yes, it's important that information is disclosed, but we really need to engage in discussions as to how they will be disclosed going forward. And for me personally, the most challenging thing is that I'm not a developer, I'm not a data analyst, analyst. I'm just a reporter or a journalist. So I had to play the role of the planner or the producer in this project. And understanding the task that uh, need to be done by other team members was the most difficult thing for me. So, for example, uh, for design, you know, there were my own ideas about design, but from a designer's point of view, there are many, many unnecessary things. And when we want uh, the experts to make a data analysis, um, the experts had different ideas uh, as to what data is significant and important than what we had. So, so going forward, the press organizations or media organizations would have to think about ways to best coordinate the works of these people with different expertise in a single team. Yes, you're right. It's a tedious job inputting data into Excel sheet. You know, many people think that with just a click of a button, all these data go into the Excel sheet, but that's not true. So many manual efforts are required, and people now know about this, I'm sure, because you said this in your presentation. And now I have a common question for all three of you. So I know we still have a long way to go. We have this conference, we have the war ceremony, but we still have a long way to go to truly go towards data journalism. We have many obstacles along the way. You know, to talk about people's story through data, we need to make a lot of improvements here in Korea still. So for Korean media to pursue data journalism in an improved way, what should be changed or what do you want the media to do? Uh, Ms. Pyeon jin -kyung, can you go first? Well, from the perspective of a single journalist or from the media, what I have to tell you is that we have to study on and on. That's one thing I had to learn myself a lot because I realized that how ignorant I was and where I had been before this because my area of concern was very minor compared to the whole society's issues. We have many tools, we have many devices to work with, and I was doing my job only the way I was doing so far. I was kind of feeling like a small fish in a small pond. But I was able to see and look out of my pond. I'm able to now do something better to get out of this pond. So this is my feeling right now. In order for these opportunities to be given to the younger generation, investment should be made by the media on a grander scale than now. And I really look forward to KPF doing more jobs like that. And also, in terms of the data provision, even if the data is made, if that's a kept secret from other people, well, that will not be helpful. Even if the data is released onto the site, I did not care about the after job of showing the data. I have to monitor and check that to make sure that if my data is really meeting the audience. Thank you. So I'm embarrassed to say that I have a PhD because there are still so many things for me to learn. And this is an endless struggle, I believe. Uh, Mr. Nam Jiang, can you also answer that question? Yes. First of all, there are different know-hows accumulated by different media companies. And, you know, if we could just know and use the format that the data is organized in, that would really be convenient for us because that's one obstacle. And I do hope that the know-hows will be shared amongst ourselves in conferences like this. And for those that can be disclosed, you know, I hope you will take the bold decision to really disclose them. That, that will save us a lot of time from carrying out the tedious tasks. And if we are able to do so, 
we will be able to engage more number of journalists in this journey or the process. Yes, I do really hope that uh, more media companies would share what they have and their know-how so that we can really reduce our, our time in doing tedious work. Mr. Lee hyung uh, yes, so the number of clicks or number of viewers is not the criteria for uh, determining the success of a coverage or an article, and I hope that is that the case for data journalism, because not many people actually come to the interactive news sometimes, although it's well written. So today we have this, uh, and I hope that the organization will make more investment, in other words, give more budget for data journalists to advance further in the organization. Yes, I do hope so too. Uh, once again, I congratulate all of you for receiving the awards and I enjoyed your presentations. Uh, the time is up, so we will have to end the Q&A session here. Thank you so much for your input, and we hope that you will continue to write excellent articles going forward.